Welcome. Happy Lunar New Year. I wasn't uh, planning to do this on the new year, but uh, just bad, bad planning on my part. Uh, we, we're celebrating here in Hong Kong, even though these are somewhat dark times, uh, but it's, it's a holiday here. Uh, but I'm here together with you to talk about meta-analyses. Not only meta-analyses, uh, but a very specific uh, way of doing a meta-analysis that has to do with conducting open, reproducible meta-analyses. Uh, we're going to touch on both correlational and experimental uh, meta-analyses. For those who just joined now uh, in the chat or on the slides that you're looking at right now, uh, you can download the slides, you can download all the uh, cloud folder. Uh, there's going to be some goodies in there, uh, examples that I go through, uh, templates. Uh, but everything is not only just on the cloud folder, but everything that we do is completely open. It's uh, collaborative, uh, so you cannot just uh, come in and, and use it. You can also come in and join us. So all of these are invitations for you. Uh, to either conduct your own meta-analysis uh, using our tools and resources or to join us in developing these things as a community, the open science community, trying to increase uh, the reproducibility of uh, meta-analyses. Previous workshops that we've done, uh, you can see over here, I previously touched on how to uh, use Jamovi R JASP today. I'll demonstrate some stuff uh, from Jamovi and JASP uh, and also uh, with R. Uh, Jamovi and JASP are good open source alternatives to SPSS. They run on R and nowadays they can also conduct meta-analysis. R is a programming language uh, that we use in statistics in order to run all sorts of things. It's very powerful. So in this workshop over here, uh, it's about two and a half hours. I touch on the power of R, but I mostly focus on Jamovi and how to do things that are not related to meta-analysis, so you can visit that. Uh, today, we'll also talk about how to do pre-registrations and register reports for meta-analysis. But if you want to know how to do this for your correlational studies or for your experimental studies, then you're welcome to go and, and have a look uh, at that uh, using this. Uh, after we finish this workshop, this will be posted over here as well. So just, uh, you know, in the future, if you want to, you're very welcome to uh, just subscribe to that channel and keep track of uh, what we do. I try every month to do uh, another um, workshop on some topic that's related to open science. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about what we do here at the University of Hong Kong, what is the open science movement? What is my relationship to this whole thing? then you're welcome to have a look at my open science talks, uh, different playlist on the same channel. Um, I'm going to be referring to the work of my collaborators. I'm very proud of this team. Uh, most of this team is made of early career researchers. These are students as early as undergraduate going all the way uh, to uh, I'd say advanced assistant professor, but it's like we're all very uh, young, enthusiastic, open science, supportive uh, folks. I think the exception here is Krishna, who is like the most senior, but he joined me uh, in this journey together with his students at Singapore, where uh, the last workshop I think that I gave on a meta-analysis was with them. And it's amazing that uh, this was 2019, we were able to um, finish two meta-analyses together that have in principle acceptance as a registered report. So we'll, I'll give a lot of examples from uh, these two meta-analyses. Uh, Adrian over here uh, joined me in uh, pre-registered meta-analysis uh, and I'll present some of his work on the meta-analysis templates. And then we have uh, a whole team of people who are uh, joined us, collaborators, helping us to improve the templates. And hopefully at some point, this will be submitted as a manuscript. You're very welcome to join this team. So if you go on the templates, you contribute anything, just add your name in there. And when we submit this to the journal, uh, uh, you'll be a collaborator, co-author. So this is how we work in the open science community. Everybody is welcome to join. Whatever you have to contribute uh, is very welcome. 
Also, all some uh, slides uh, credits. So I'll, I took work from uh, others, and uh, some of those are not my own. So I took uh, some stuff from the uh, Neuro team over here, which I'll touch on. Daniel Lackens, you'll hear from him soon in a video. Uh, Joe, Jin, uh, Martin, and Dan Quintana, they'll all pop up at some point during this during this talk. So it's not just uh, my stuff, it's uh, a lot of very active people in the open science community. And, and many of those are early career researchers, which makes me very proud. And you'll see that also some of these have to do with this uh, Society of Improvement of Psychological Science. So these are teams that are trying to improve uh, the quality of meta-analyses in our uh, in our fields psychology mostly uh, but also going beyond that all right so the structure very briefly um, i'll start uh, directly from hands-on demonstration uh, you don't still know what is a meta-analysis i know you do but let's assume that you don't uh, before I tell you what meta-analysis is, I'm going to show you one, uh, and this is going to be a very specific type of meta-analysis called a mini meta-analysis. So this is a meta-analysis of your own studies, not a comprehensive systematic review, but something that's uh, more directed at your own studies, trying to aggregate a small number of studies. This is just so you don't have to wait an hour until you see what that looks like. Uh, we want to uh, know how uh, straightforward the me uh, meta-analysis is. So I want to start with a hands-on demonstration and then we'll go deeper uh, into what is a meta-analysis, not a mini, but a full meta-analysis. And I'll do this by using a case study. And this is a very famous case study, uh, one that I also care very deeply about from our literature in social psychology. Uh, so even if you're from other fields, maybe you're not familiar with this, uh, I won't go into detail about what the phenomena is, but I'll go into detail about all the considerations regarding a meta-analysis. I'll also explain things regarding effect sizes because I feel like in the literature, we don't uh, um, address these much. We focus very much on no hypothesis significance testing, uh, the infamous p-value is p-value lower than 0 0.05, but a meta-analysis emphasizes effect sizes. What is an effect size? How do we uh, look at effect sizes? How do we interpret these? So I'll touch on that. And then we'll start looking at actually a meta-analysis like in depth, uh, how to do, the, do these and how to do these uh, well. Doing this open, reproducible, I'll talk about some of the challenges uh, why uh, most of the meta-analysis that we've conducted are just not up to uh, the standards that are needed. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just uh, demonstrate some stuff from, uh, you know, this uh, wonderful team uh, that, I, that I told you about. So how do you do search and coding? How do you uh, actually aggregate all this? And I'll present some templates uh, that you can just take uh, and adapt to whatever it is that you're doing. So we've developed some tools for you that you can use uh, including code, including uh, coding sheet, um, everything that you'll need in order for you to conduct your experimental and correlational analysis. All right, so uh, looking at the chat, I see that there are no specific uh, questions. Uh, if at any time you have some questions, let me know. So we'll start from this uh, mini meta-analysis uh, by doing a demonstration. Um, I just want to show you how easy it is and how practical uh, it is for you to do this in your own in your own studies. I'll start from um, you know what what mini meta analysis uh, offer you. Uh, mini meta analysis offers you a better understanding of your own effect. So let's say that you conducted a multi-study uh, article. You you had an investigation. You did I don't know two studies, three studies, eight studies. Uh, again and again, you looked at the same phenomena. And now after you have these eight, you wanna say something about what is the effect? What is the impact? What is the association? If it's correlation or what is association? If it's an experimental or RCT, so what is the impact of the intervention or the manipulation on, on the outcome? Um, so between the studies, there's some deviation. In study one, you had uh, uh, this effect. In study two, you had this effect. 
So if we have this effect, so what does this mean for the phenomena? Let's say somebody wants to follow up on your research and they're doing something called a power analysis. And we'll talk about what a power analysis is. So they want to know what kind of sample they need in order to study your effect. How do they know? They have eight studies. You've reported all the eight studies. Now what? Uh, should we go with a study number number one or study number seven? How do we know uh, what we should plan our study uh, on? Which effect of these? So we want to try and aggregate these. We want to say uh, of the eight studies that we've conducted, this is our effect size. This is what you should uh, use in order uh, for you to conduct your own studies in your power analysis. Another thing that is important for conducting a mini meta analysis is that increasingly we've realized that we, uh, we kind of um, failed to report everything that we've been doing. So if you look at a typical multi-study article, let's say a JPSP from 2009, you have uh, eight different studies, uh, study number one, study number two, each one of them contributes something, but then we realized that actually, when we look at the results of all these eight studies, eight out, eight out of eight seem to be uh, significant. So we've reported everything that is significant. Uh, how likely is it that everything is significant? Um, how do we aggregate this kind of thing? So there's this one, pa one paper that came out by Daniel Lackens that I, I will uh, mention uh, very soon. Uh, that looks at this, this shiny app that shows you what is the likelihood, if you have a JPSP of eight studies, what is the likelihood that eight out of eight will be significant? And I want to show you very briefly this shiny app. I'm going to press on this and I'll walk together with you. So let's just look at this um, shiny app, for example. Uh, shiny app is uh, something that's built with R. So they give it a very nice interface. So uh, very quickly, I'll show you how I developed an R Shiny app. So you can do simulations, simulate all sorts of things using R, and then um, conveying some kind of uh, information. So what I like about this uh, study, this is Lackens and Etz, uh, 2017, published in Social Psychological Personality Science. And I like this title, Too True to be Bad When Sets of Studies with Significant and Non-Significant Findings are Probably True. So let's say that we have a typical uh, JPSP study from uh, 2009, and we have uh, eight studies, and eight out of eight uh, were significant. Um, and if we uh, examine power, which is uh, one type of error, um, so a typical JPSP studies back then, things were not very well powered, so our samples were very, very small. And the assumed power of most of these studies were somewhere about uh, 0 0.35. And what we can see over here is that this simulation, this shiny app, gives you the likelihood that you have eight out of eight giving uh, the p-value of 0 0.05 and an assumed power one minus beta, uh, so 0 0.35. What is the likelihood of this? And the nice thing about this um, simulation is that it gives you a conclusion over here, uh, both in text and with a table. So what it says is that when H1 is true, so let's say uh, you're rejecting the null hypothesis, in the long run, the probability of observing eight out of eight with significant studies given this kind of power is, how likely is it? 0 0.0002251. <laughs> How likely is it that eight out of eight in this uh, JPSP um, with this kind of power came out significant? Very unlikely. What does it mean if we have eight out of eight and it's very, very unlikely that there's probably a lot of studies that were not significant that were not reported? I'll give you this uh, more detailed um, kind of uh, table over here. So the most likely out of this, so zero out of eight is 3%. One out of eight is 13%. Two out of eight, 25%. How likely is eight out of eight? <laughs> very, very small. So almost uh, impossible. So probably we have some publication uh, bias over here. Uh, we have some file drawers. So we conducted some studies, but in order to have a very clean narrative, we've only submitted to JPSP some of the things 
that are, uh, you know, only the things that are significant. And there are some of the things that we didn't report that are somewhere in the, in the far drawer. And this is leading to a lot of issues that we'll talk about later when we do a meta-analysis and a publication bias. But just look at this thing. The most likely, when you have this kind of power, 35, the most likely is the three out of eight will be significant. Eight out of eight, very, very difficult. Let's say that we improve this power. Let's raise this. So, you know, now we try and aim for 0.8. And what happens when it's 0.8? Even when it's 0.8, you know, the most likely is that seven out of eight will be significant. Uh, um, after that, six out of eight. Uh, but the, the third uh, likely is eight out of eight. So even when you have 0.8 uh, power, um, one is likely to, uh, at least one, is likely to um, be, be non-significant. Um, which is why when we do mass replications, when we try to uh, run uh, studies, we try and aim for uh, much higher than that. We try to aim for power of 95, and then it's 66% that eight out of eight become significant, but it's also still likely that eight, seven out of eight will be, uh, will be significant. Um, and then if we increase this to uh, 99, even then there's an 8% chance that we don't have eight out of eight. So what am I trying to, to tell you uh, with this whole thing? I'm trying to tell you that it's possible that when you conduct a lot of studies, some of them will be non-significant. Now, this emphasis that we have on the p-value and non-significant is problematic because at the end, you've conducted all the studies and all of them are valuable and you want to aggregate them uh, together. Uh, and the problem is, uh, we, we don't have a good tool for that um, until you know this mini meta-analysis thing can, came up. And in 2016, 17, uh, a few studies came up suggesting that the way that we need to communicate this, we need to report all the studies, significant, not significant, not relevant, because all of these are of value. And then together, we um, give some uh, conclusion. Another good thing about this is that, you know, study one had this kind of power, study two had this kind of power, study three had the power, but if you aggregate these together, you also benefit, assuming of course, that the deviation is the, uh, the variation between the studies is not too large, but you can come at a conclusion and then kind of get all the power together. So uh, meta-analysis allows you to aggregate all of these and benefit from uh, you know, the, the sample size of all of these uh, together. What does that look like? I'm going to show you from my own studies. Uh, so we'll start, uh, so I suggested you can see over here that you uh, download the cloud folder. So this is the link over here and it's also in the chat. Uh, for those who uh, just uh, join now, I'm going to copy and paste this again. So you can download things from the cloud folder. I'll just show you what this cloud folder looks like. So this is the meta-analysis uh, workshop. And you can see we have a number uh, of directories over here. And there's also this folder called meta-analysis examples, which is the one that we'll uh, use right now. Um, templates, I'll go in and I'll talk about this uh, later. Uh, but right now we'll focus on Gilad meta uh, examples. And in that we have mini meta demonstration, mini meta demonstration. We have correlational and we have experimental. I'm gonna show you what this looks like. So a mini meta demonstration, uh, we'll do one that has to do uh, maybe, yeah, let's do the free will beliefs. I wanna show you what the manuscript looks like first, just so you understand what does it mean to aggregate three studies? So we'll open uh, this manuscript. It was in PSPB. Um, related to something that I did during uh, my PhD uh, thesis. So I was studying things like uh, free will beliefs. Uh, free will beliefs, so it's about agency, whether people believe that they have free will or not. Um, and uh, because I was doing this at the business school, they really care about outcomes. So they uh, asked me whether I can associate this with outcomes. And I wanted to see whether people uh, with uh, free will, if it's associated with their job satisfaction. So what did we do? So these are my collaborators from HKUSD. Uh, we had three studies. In these three studies, we examined in study one, we had this uh, very nice uh, data set from these Taiwanese real estate agents. Uh, three times, three months a period, so time one and time two. So in study one, we had 252. In study two, we had 137 
Americans on Amazon Mechanical Turk, or this is their job. So it's uh, you can use MTurk very easily to ask them how they feel about this job. And over there, we have a six month months gap. And then we used an archive uh, data. Uh, this is the World Value Survey. And over in the World Value Survey, uh, they've been asked about their jobs. And there's also one measure that is a, a proxy that we use for free will beliefs. You know and degree to which people uh, believe that they have choice in their lives and it has 16 countries all sorts of country level and then what we concluded is that we found a, a consistent positive relationship this is the interesting bit that i wanted to show you so in this paper we also had this section called general results a mini meta-analysis we followed the emerging practice of performing a mini meta analysis. The overall effect size for this basic link between free will beliefs and job satisfaction in time one was 0.29 and in, part, in time two, uh, 0.25. How did we uh, come to, uh, to do that? Here is the conclusion. I want you to look at this table. I'm going to increase this just so you can see what that looks like. So in time one, we had this effect. 0.35 in time one in study two, we have 0.31. And the large one, the one with uh, uh, this kind of sample, uh, we had uh, 0.22. So just think about this for a second. So now you want to, somebody wants to do a follow up study and they want to look at the association between free will beliefs and job satisfaction. Which one of these should they look at? This effect, this effect, or this effect? What should we communicate? To, uh, to the audiences, how to aggregate this. So we conducted a mini meta. And over here, you can see uh, both the effects and the confidence intervals of these effects. So this is for time one, and this is for time two. How did I do this? Uh, what's, what's, uh, what's the magic here to conduct this uh, mini meta analysis? It's super simple. Back then, this was 2000 and can't remember, 14, um, 14 and 15, something like that. I was not very, um, you know, I didn't have uh, the wonderful tools that I'll show you uh, with Jamovi and Jast. And uh, R was too complicated for my collaborators. Uh, they knew all sorts of things like SPSS, but not R. So I was thinking, how do I help them to see the mini meta analysis? And this is where, just like I showed you with the Lacan's uh, Shiny app, I developed a Shiny app in R. And this is what you can see in the main directory over here. Uh, so this is 2017. I think this was because of our R&R that we had. So I'm going to open uh, R Studio just so you see what this uh, looks like. Uh, don't be scared by the interface. So if you're not familiar with R, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, what I want to show you, uh, you know, both my collaborators also did not know R. So for them, all of this is very, very scary. Uh, what is going on over here? There's all this code. Uh, I don't want to touch this. Uh, but the interesting thing is that over here, if you look at this uh, interface, this shiny app, you have something called a run app. So if I push this run app, it's going to uh, open an interface. So it's kind of like running my, my code. And then what I uh, gave to my uh, collaborators is simply this uh, this interface uh, over here. And what you can see is that uh, this says to create a mini meta-analysis, you need to upload a CSV file with the following columns, study, sample size, and correlation between X and Y. So I created this, uh, very easy to see that over here. So for example, here you can see summary of time one. So if I open this file, you'll see how simple it is. How did I aggregate these three, three studies? You can see that you have study, N, and R. And if you remember, uh, study one in time one, this is the sample, and this is the correlation. Study two, this is sample, this is the correlation. So the only thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to upload. So uh, first of all, I code. So you can code this for your own study in your own uh, article, or you can code this for some, somebody else that you want to aggregate. And then you simply uh, upload this to, uh, you choose the CSV file, and you upload the summary time one. And what you can see over here is that exactly what you saw in the CSV appears here as the loaded file. And here you already have meta-analysis results. So it conducts a mini meta-analysis of these studies. And what you can see is that the estimate, 
is 0 0.27. So we've had different effects over here, but when you aggregate all these together, it gives you a 0 0.27. This is the lower confidence. This is the lower confidence interval, and this is the higher confidence interval. We'll talk about what that means. Now, over here, you have what's called a forest plot. And a forest plot um, is, uh, you know, this, this diagram over here, we have study one, study two, and study three. And um, what you can see over here is that this is the first effect with the confidence interval. And then you can see it goes from the left side to the right side. Correlation zero is over here in the dotted line. And then what you can see in the middle is where the effect actually is. Now, you can see that the third one, which had a very, very large sample, uh, the, the, the third one was a sample of 15,000 has a very big square in the middle and not very wide confidence intervals, whereas the one that was the, the smallest sample had uh, this kind of wider confidence intervals. And you can see that the, the one in, in you know, the effect in the middle is very, very small. So first of all, you've got the confidence intervals and then the sample size is represented by the number of the rectangle. Now, what a meta-analysis or a mini meta-analysis in this case tries to do is that it tries, uh, it tries to aggregate everything together and then it gives you this diamond uh, talking about random effect models and then it tries to aggregate everything together. The left side of the diamond is the low uh, confidence interval and then the high confidence interval on the right uh, side of the diamond and it gives you the aggregated effect size. It also gives this kind of plot and we'll come back to this plot. This is called a funnel plot. And then it can give you all sorts of tests that are not so relevant for a mini meta-analysis, but it gives you some estimation of whether there's a publication bias. Because this is all my studies and it's just a mini meta-analysis, then this is uh, less relevant uh, for us uh, over here. All right, so this is what I did back in the day. <laughs> Uh, but uh, nowadays we have a much better uh, way to do this. First of all, I'm going to show you uh, a remarkable tool. It's called uh, Mavis uh, by Kyle. Uh, it, I think last updated in 2017, but you can... And what you can see over here is that it allows you to do uh, this kind of uh, very nice uh, meta-analysis. You can do this on correlations. You can do this on mean differences. Uh, dichotomous models, whatever it is that you uh, like. Let's do, for example, um, a correlational one. So the correlations over here, we go back to the main and we tell them that we want a correlation and then we do update view. What you can see over here is that it does a correlation um, of, of a few things. Let's assume you can, of course, copy and paste this from your own uh, studies. I can actually, you know, take, take these. And you can see the nice thing about this Shiny app is that it automatically updates over here. So every time I put something in there and do update view, it kind of gives me everything. And just like uh, you saw in my own uh, very old Shiny app on um, the R Studio, this does exactly the same thing. It gives me both fixed effects and random effects. Um, both of these are reported and once again you can see you know the kind of difference so this is very similar to what i just showed you in my own uh, meta-analysis it also does this transformation to a uh, fisher's uh, z uh, which is why it's slightly different although very very similar to what i just showed you and then just like you saw in mine it also gives you uh, this kind of study so instead of updating a csv uploading this to a Shiny app. Now you have this Shiny app and it runs on the internet and you can uh, very easily uh, do this. Uh, every one of these things you can download as a plot and as a PDF. Um, so whatever it is that you want to run, you can basically just go on this very interesting in interface. Everything is run on R. You can punch in your studies. This is study one, study two, study three, put the N, put the R, and uh, you're done with your correlational mini meta-analysis. It's that easy. Now, the problem with this uh, sort of thing is that it's not very reproducible, which is a shame. I'm going to close this, which is why uh, I recommend doing things in Jamovi. So just like you saw over here uh, with this study and our moderator, you can see that exactly the same stats I also uh, punched in here in Jamovi. You can go and you can download Jamovi. Uh, uh, it's free, uh, runs on R. Um, 
has a bunch of things. If you don't have everything that I have, you can go and watch my other um, talk about uh, Jamovi, but you can install things in Jamovi. It has this plus sign over here for modules. You can go on Jamovi and update uh, uh, the modules. Uh, the model that I'm going to show you right now is Major. It's the one uh, over here. <clears throat> yeah, comment on moderator. I'll, I'll comment on moderators for sure. Um, so you can see over here that there is major, and you can do uh, meta analysis on all sorts of things, on correlations, on mean differences, on proportions. You can also do a Bayesian uh, meta analysis. So uh, that's nice. And a more recent uh, addition is the multi-level models, correlation, mean differences, dichotomous models. It's in very heavy development. Uh, by Kyle. Uh, yesterday, as I was preparing for this uh, workshop, I was uh, I came across uh, some problems which made me think perhaps I shouldn't show you this version. Perhaps I should show you the other version. Uh, some things didn't work, so I just uh, wrote on Twitter to Kyle saying, "Hey, this doesn't seem to work. Do you have any issue?" Within like ten minutes, he gave me he released another version for me fixing uh, everything. So Kyle is approachable. He does an amazing work, both with the Shiny app and with this module. And uh, because it's in heavy development, there could be some problems, but he is interested in your feedback and he's very quick to respond. Uh, really uh, holy work uh, by, by Kyle and the Jamovi team in general over here. So what, what do you see over here? The nice thing about Jamovi is that you have the data, so you can punch in the data uh, manually if you want, or you can, uh, of course, import things from uh, CSV or um, SPSS file, whatever your type is. But the thing about here on the right, unlike SPSS, you know, it's disconnected. SPSS, let's say you have the data and then you have the syntax file and then you have the output. Here, everything is tied together. So when I click on the output, this opens up. Just to tell you which file uh, I opened over here, if you go over here, the Jamovi files are the ones that end in OMV. So everything that ends in OMV are the Jamovi files. If you double click on this, it should open up. So if I click on the output, immediately it shows me this kind of like SPSS uh, style uh, window. And you can see that basically I took the R, the N, and the study and I punched it in over here. So I put this under correlations, I put this under sample sizes and the study label. And immediately it produced this wonderful, wonderful mini meta-analysis. So you can see over here uh, the, the estimate. So also it does all the Fisher Z uh, transformations. It shows me all sorts of other stuff as well. It produces this wonderful forest spot that we just saw from before, plus some additional things like the weights. So this has the most weight. Um, this has the least, uh, dependent, of course, on sample size, but not, but not only. And what you can see over here is this kind of like diamond uh, shape in the, the, the final uh, conclusion. Also, in addition, not relevant for mini meta, but you have all sorts of things like a publication bias assessment. You have the, the funnel plots. You have all sorts of things like uh, trim and fill that we'll touch on, on late, uh, later. Also, you'll be able, we'll come back to these things like uh, what is a P curve? So what is the P uh, value uh, distribution uh, and equivalence uh, test, uh, which, which, is, which is remarkable for this kind of thing. So just by punching in a few uh, fields, going to major, running a correlation coefficient uh, and uh, you know, putting things in the right field, you can uh, conduct your meta-analysis. If you want to see another example, you can just open and you can see uh, that uh, over here, we have uh, two data sets uh, with, uh, that came in with the Jamovi. Uh, so you can see one for correlations and one for uh, mean differences. So I'll just show you what this looks like. I'll open the data, the data file. Yes. So you can see what this looks like. Uh, there's a few studies over here, 16 studies. So this is no longer a mini meta-analysis. This looks more like uh, a, a real meta-analysis. Um, and then we'll go here, we'll do the correlational uh, correlation coefficient, and then we'll add things in here. So we want to add the correlations. We want to add the sample size. 
we want to add um, study label. What is the study label here? Let's say it's A. We'll give it a second. And then you can see immediately it does everything for me, uh, including the force part. So I can see all the distribution uh, and, and other things. Now, if somebody asked about a moderator, here we have a moderator and you can just like add it here in the moderator type. You'll also need to uh, say whether this is categorical moderator or a continuous moderator and uh, you know what kind of things you want to do with it. I'm not gonna go into it right now because this is like a quick demonstration, but just to say, that this is very powerful. So within a few clicks, you can add prediction interval, model fitting, uh, funnel plots in all sorts of ways. Publication bias, it has excess significance, P-curve, P-uniform selection models. So very, very powerful stuff. And Kyle just keeps uh, adding stuff to it. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. So this was the correlational one. I'm gonna show you uh, an example from, um, an experimental one. So in experimental one, we have this mini meta de demonstration, um, same sort of thing, another paper that we uh, published where we aggregated four different studies. Uh, once again, you can have a look at my uh, Shiny app, which is very old school, or you can uh, simply go and open the, the Jamovi file um, or use uh, the Mavis over here. So if we input the example, so this is an example of an experimental one. What does it look like? looks like this. So for experimental ones, we're typically uh, comparing the experimental condition to the control condition. So um, we can see over here is that I just plotted for, uh, you know, this contrast for each contrast, what uh, was the uh, sample size, what was the mean, what was the standard deviation, uh, contrasting this uh, one against the other, updating this, and within a few uh, seconds, it gives me everything that I need to know about the effects. Um, so you can see all the data here uh, put nicer. So, you know, the mean, the mean, the standard deviation, standard deviation, and then finally the effect size. So this is a Cohen's D. This is a standardized effect size. It has a fixed effects model. Um, had a fixed effects model, a random effects model, and then the wonderful force part. So you can do this Jamovi, you can do this in uh, uh, the, the, the Shiny app, this uh, Mavis uh, thing, or you can of course create your own just like I did uh, back with, with R. It's very, very uh, simplified. Uh, so this is a good tool for you to conduct your own mini meta analysis of your own studies. You can use these citations in order to uh, say something about those. Let me see. Uh, some of the questions. Does Shiny app have the function of changing how the plots look like uh, colors? So um, I think he, we, we saw uh, Kyle in Jamovi uh, has a few ways to change some of these plots, but they come out of the box. So there's not that too much that you can do uh, over there using, using that interface. Uh, if you want to change some of the colors and the length and all that, you'll need to uh, mess around with some R code. Uh, it's not it's not too difficult. Uh, so we have a lot of templates. You can adapt the code from our templates for whatever it is that you need. Um, I don't know how comfortable you feel with code, but if you want to change things like colors and lengths and all that, you'll need to mess around a little bit with code. The good thing about Jamovi. Uh, is that it runs on R, so you can export some of these things from Jamovi to R. But really, if you want to change the way that things look, you will need to uh, use a little bit of code. However, I also encourage you uh, to open a request for Kyle. So Kyle will be responsive. If you tell him, I would like to change the colors, I think Kyle will be very happy to implement something like that. So as a community, we can uh, work on things together uh, and then improve these tools. Uh, and these are much better tools because they're open, they're reproducible. Um, and so any, anybody else who will want to follow on your mini meta-analysis or your full meta-analysis, will be able to reproduce those. So let Kyle know what you want to implement in Jamovi. Wait uh, between uh, 10, 10 minutes to uh, I don't know, a few, a few uh, weeks, and then it will, it will be implemented. Uh, another question, what is the benefit of Jamovi for a user that is comfortable with R metaphor? Uh, no, don't. <laughs> if you're comfortable with R, 
and metaphor uh, don't don't use Jamovi. Jamovi is really if you want to, uh, let's say you want to share this with your collaborators, they, they don't feel comfortable uh, with R. That's a good way of sharing this uh, with them. If you're comfortable with R and metaphor, then, then just just go ahead and, and do this uh, with R. Nowadays, it's you know it's very simplified code. You don't really need to work that hard in R as we used to back in 2015. So. Jamovi is really, if you don't want to mess around with R, if you want something quick, like a mini meta-analysis, um, and I think it just takes away all the hassle of the code. Let's say you just want a forest plot, you want a simple funnel plot, you want a, a conclusion. Uh, this is a very easy way to do this within a few minutes. But if you can, if you can do R, uh, please do R, uh, much, much better. Now, why, why, so this was a mini meta-analysis. I just wanted to really show you what um, meta-analysis looks like. So, you know, we have the aggregated effect size, we have the confidence intervals, the low, the high, we have a forest plot and a funnel plot. Why, why do we want to do uh, a meta-analysis? Um, so, this is generally my motivation. So if you're not sure why, why you're here uh, listening to this talk, uh, then uh, you're, you're welcome to, <laughs> to go uh, through these uh, to motivate yourself. But generally my perspective is that a meta-analysis, a, meta a full-pledged meta-analysis offers uh, an advanced integrative uh, view of an entire literature. So I started, I think my first one was uh, about action in action, omission bias. I wanted to uh, understand um, you know, the, these experiments better. And then it seemed like there's this whole literature that I don't know much about. Um, and then I look at one study, it says one thing. I look at another study, it says another thing. But if I want the overall uh, you know, overview, a uh, very high uh, view of the literature, rather than just looking at each one of these studies, I can just you know, do, do an entire meta-analysis and come to a conclusion about the entire uh, literature. It really allowed me uh, in-depth knowledge of the domain, uh, looking not just at the published results, but also on the unpublished ones. The first meta-analysis I did was 2013 about personal values. So I teamed up with some personal values researcher. And through that meta-analysis, because I contacted authors, I asked them for uh, their data, I was able to form a lot of ties with other researchers in the field. So I was just a PhD student starting out my career, not really uh, you know, a lot of experience, uh, definitely no reputation whatsoever. But just by contacting others and talking to them about their research, it allowed me to form some ties. So next time I was in a conference, you know, the personal values folks, it's a very tight group. So now you get to know them a little bit better. Same with the uh, judgment and decision making. It's very valuable because uh, whatever it is that you uh, find is, is uh, interesting, uh, you want to know what is the summary, what is the aggregated effect size for the future research uh, and practice. So if you build on future studies, if you want to tell practitioners or you want to tell uh, you know, students uh, what to take away from this literature, uh, and aggregated effect size uh, really helps. It also uh, gives insights like identifying moderators. Uh, what are the challenges in this literature? Is there some kind of problem? Did, did you uh, see all sorts of promising future directions? So really nice insights. Then of all of my publications, ha don't have that many, but the ones that are the, the most cited are definitely the meta-analysis. So people tend to refer to meta-analysis when they conduct their own studies. So it also has to, uh, leads typically to be a very high impact and well cited. Now, these last two parts, I think are especially relevant uh, for early career researchers, uh, relatively lower risk. So if you think about this, I added all sorts of challenges for early careers. So for me in my PhD, I had all these problems about uh, very limited resources. Um, I didn't have my own participant pool, so I had to beg other uh, professors to maybe give me a couple of uh, you know, uh, runs. And I had very limited experience. And of course, I competed like everybody else in the job market. And uh, even if you get a job, then you need to compete for tenure. And th this, is, this is a big problem for early career uh, researchers. 
And then meta-analysis really allows you to focus uh, on, on what is required for, for this. So you can do this with very little resources. So meta-analysis is on everything that already exists. Uh, you can just go on the literature. You don't need participant pool. Just go and do a search. Uh, very low risk. Um, it's much, much uh, easier uh, to go through these in the journals. The journals tend to value this a little bit more. And then there's no this p-value lower than 0 0.05 obsession. It more focuses on effect sizes. Um, and then it has a lot of impact. So really um, a lot of benefits for you as an early career researcher. If you don't have resources, if you want something that's straightforward, if some questions, did all authors give you <laughs> their data? I wish uh, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy as that. Um, so in our templates and everything that I share, you'll see um, a call for papers, a call for data. Um, so uh, we ask people to, before you talk about data, first of all, share their manuscripts. And uh, manuscripts are a little bit easier because these are published, but some of the authors are hesitant to share their unpublished drafts or the things that are in the file drawer. It's very difficult to get people to, to share these which is why I'm hopeful that with the open science movement, more researchers will post preprints, more researchers will uh, share data on open science framework. The point that I want to say about sharing data is that we don't always need data. Data is helpful. So if you have raw data, that's terrific. But um, most of the times you'll be able to make some approximation of what the effect size is given an article. Uh, you'll be able to extract. If it's a correlation, it's quite straightforward. You, most of the correlations are, are uh, reported. When it comes to experimental RCT, it's much more difficult because sometimes they don't give you the actual Cohen's D, the effect size, the mean differences. And then you have to uh, do all sorts of conversions in order to get what the effect size is. And I'll touch on this a little bit later. We have a guide for this and we have all sorts of resources to help you calculate the effect size even if you don't have the data. Um, yeah, so most of the time you don't need the original data but the original data is always helpful, especially when there's some things that you don't understand about the actual, uh, the actual article. Uh, and a lot of them are very lacking, especially if you aggregate things from, let's say, before 2010, most of the papers don't really report things very well. It's not that they don't share data, they just are, our methods and results sections are very, very brief, uh, unfortunately. So we have, to, we have to try and do better. All right, so a meta-analysis, what does it do? Uh, what kind of research question does it answer? So this is where I want to plug in uh, uh, Daniel Lackens. So Daniel, I owe him quite a lot because doing my postdoc, he was one hour away. I was doing my postdoc in Maastricht. He was one hour away in Eindhoven. He's still there. I moved away to, to Hong Kong. And during my postdoc, I occasionally uh, took the train to attend some of his workshops. And I realized how um, little I know about things that I thought I knew something about. So uh, un unfortunately, um, I believe that during my PhD, you know, throughout all of my training, I wasn't considering things as simple as what am I doing? What research am I pursuing? What is it that I should focus on and how to do this uh, well? So of course I knew p-value lower than 0.05. I knew, you know, I want to do a correlation. I want to, to do an experiment, but I didn't take the time into really considering what are the questions that I should be asking or how to draw uh, good inferences from what it is that I'm doing. I highly recommend these two courses. They're completely free. Uh, you can see the ratings. The ratings are very, very high, 4.9. You can see just how many people attended this sort of thing. Uh, many of these lectures are shared on YouTube. I'll show you a little bit from Daniel uh, about his meta-analysis. And I like this kind of slide because it really summarizes the thing about a meta-analysis. So which question does a meta-analysis answer? Actually ask what sources of variations are there in this set of data? So I'll let Daniel uh, introduce the, the topic. 
Can you please share the links for this course on the chat? I, I just want to say all of the slides you can see over here, these are the slides. So you can just go to uh, my slides and download. This is this is the cloud folder. So no need, no need to ask me for links, just download the slides and then um, all the links, you know, you can just click on them and 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 take it take it from there. There's going to be a lot of links, so I just recommend just download the slides and and punch it in. Oh yeah, somebody helped me. Thank you very much. All right, um, let's let's see what uh, uh, Daniel has to say. In the previous lecture, we talked about how mixed results are likely to happen. Sometimes you can read the scientific literature and you can find conflicting findings. It's useful to be able to integrate these and to evaluate differences between sets of studies. We can do so through meta-analysis. In some way, if you design and report a study, in the ideal case, it's actually a single data point in a future meta-analysis. Both statistically and philosophically, Performing close replications is essential for science. Statistically speaking, because there are always error rates, there's always variation, so repeating a study multiple times gives us a much more reliable estimate of true effects. And philosophically, it's also the same. We like other labs to replicate our studies, because there might be unknown small variations and it's a way to show that results are intersubjectively testable. Other people can find the same thing. So if we have these sets of studies, it's a good idea to actually look at the totality of the evidence. We can use a meta-analysis for this. It can be used to combine either raw effects if all of the studies have exactly the same dependent variable, you can just pull them all together. Or if all of the studies use slightly different ways to measure something, then we can use standardized effects. And a meta-analysis can be performed on both of these, the raw effects or standardized effects. Let's first think of the question that a meta-analysis actually answers. Very often people treat it as if it gives the final answer is there a true effect in the literature, yes or no? But in practice, it's hardly this simple. You can even question whether we should think about something as there being a single effect. There are very often in a meta-analysis variations in how we studied something, and these will lead to small variations in the effect size. You can argue that one of the more interesting things to do is actually to ask, what sources of variations are there in these sets of studies? And can we theoretically explain them? Or if not, can we develop theoretical ideas that might explain them in the future? So instead of thinking of a meta-analysis as giving a yes or a no answer, it's more an interesting tool to explore variation across studies and to evaluate patterns. If you have identified all the studies that you want to include in your meta-analysis, then for each of you have to calculate the effect size estimate and its variance. And this is actually all you need to perform the meta-analysis itself. However, as you go through the literature, it's also advisable to code variables that might explain variation across studies. You might think about the country in which study was performed or the type of manipulation that was used in an experiment. Calculating the effect size and its variance is actually relatively straightforward if enough data is presented in the original articles, which is regrettably not always the case. For this reason, making raw data available is very recommended because it will make future meta-analyses much easier. If all the data that you need to calculate the effect size is available, such as means and standard deviations, and for within designs, correlations between dependent variables, you can quite easily calculate the effect size and the variance. And this is all you need. Now, I realized that performing a meta-analysis itself is not actually as difficult as I always thought. I remember that I once talked to somebody who publishes quite a lot of meta-analysis and helps other people to perform meta-analysis. And I said, yeah, it's actually much less difficult than I thought. And she said, yes, Shh. don't tell anyone, because now they actually ask me for help. 
Now, there are a lot of complexities in doing a meta-analysis, in coding everything accurately, and also in accounting for things like bias. So it's not that a meta-analysis in itself is extremely easy to do. There are definitely some difficulties. But it's easy enough to try to do this if you start with a new research line, as you're reading the literature anyway, to also code the effects and the effect sizes and the sample sizes of the studies you're reading, so that you can also have a more quantitative evaluation of all the evidence. Yes, terrific. Uh, I, I like this very much. I agree that uh, the statistical analysis, the R code, you know, if you use your movie, whatever, the actual statistical method is not that complicated. Uh, however, to get a meta-analysis right, you need to go through a very rigorous uh, process of search, of coding, and we'll touch on some of the issues of how to do that. But actually running a meta-analysis, the statistical part in it is, is fairly straightforward, I think easier than some of the other things that we do uh, with our experimental correlation or uh, other, other designs. So good introduction. If you want to know more, just, you know, meta-analysis or beyond, very welcome to look at the entire video. Daniel does an amazing job at uh, helping people understand what kind of uh, questions they should be uh, ask, asking, what is a good question, what is not, and how to draw inferences from that. Now, before we go in, uh, I want to review what a meta-analysis looks like. Uh, so I showed you a mini meta-analysis. We talked about what kind of question does it answer. So we understand that it looks at an entire literature and tries to aggregate all of that together in some way and provide us with a, an aggregated effect size estimate. It can get us some moderators. Um, but when we look at an article, what actually uh, happens in there? And what are some of the complexities? Now, the interesting thing is that when I was doing my PhD back in the, you know, uh, 2010, 2014, uh, my understanding of a meta-analysis was uh, very limited. For me, a meta-analysis was state of the art, the best evidence that there is. When I saw meta-analysis, I said, this is solid stuff. This is what I should be uh, based my research on. If I see something, a meta-analysis tells me there's this effect size, I know that now I can you know, pursue this uh, sort of thing. Throughout my PhD, I realized some complexities. And I want to share with you my realization, my journey, of the complexities of a meta-analysis. And I'm going to do this with a case study. This is one of social psychology's most famous uh, effects. You open any book in social psychology and you're gonna see uh, this effect. And this has a lot to do with my own journey towards open science and why I decided that open science is a priority and why I feel it's very important, not only that we know how to do a meta-analysis, but we know how to do a meta-analysis right in an open, reproducible way. So I'll start with this uh, uh, case study about uh, ego depletion. I use this tool called Publish or Perish, uh, which I'll show you a little bit later in how to do a search. But if you look at ego depletion, you know, this is the Wikipedia entry. Ego depletion refers to the idea that self-control or willpower draws upon a limited pool of mental resources. So you have willpower. Uh, it's a little bit like a muscle, supposed to be like a muscle, so you can train it little by little, so your willpower grows and grows. It's a little bit like, a, you know, if you go to the gym and you exercise, then your muscles grow. So, so is willpower and ego depletion. And it's the ability to uh, overcome your urges, needs, and desires to uh, plan for the long term. So if you, let's say, you're dieting and you see a big chunk of ice cream that looks very inviting, then you're able to overcome and say, even though this is very inviting, I'm going to put this aside because I'm focusing on my health. I don't want to uh, you know, uh, fight obesity, and I want to keep healthy, I want to keep slim. Uh, so I'm able to override my immediate desire for ice cream in order to focus on long term uh, goals. Ego depletion was the idea that uh, just like as a muscle, if you use this muscle, it kind of uh, depletes, it becomes uh, lower and lower. So if you use more of your willpower, then it disappears. So if throughout the day, you're facing uh, colleagues, uh, uh, bosses, uh, customers, whatever it is during the day, you're exerting a lot of 
uh, willpower in order to overcome uh, your annoyance, overcome whatever your frustrations, whatever it is that you're doing. But by the end of the day, you come back home to your loved ones, yeah, you meet your friends, and then you have no more willpower left. So that's when you snap over the smallest thing, right? you get agitated, you uh, binge you know, TV shows, wasting time, uh, or you uh, go over the fridge and eat all the ice cream because you've exerted, you've finished all your willpower. So this is a very appealing kind of idea. And it's an idea that had a lot of impact. So if you look at this uh, summary from public, publish or perish, publication year started from about 94, uh, citation uh, years, 27 years, how many papers, about 730. And I had to stop the search uh, in the middle because Publish and Perish uses Google Scholar search and there was thousands of them. And at some point it started limiting my, uh, my access. Just look at the number of citations and how many citations per year for ego depletion. And these are the highest uh, top, top uh, papers. You can see, uh, uh, you know, cite 6,000 citations for the top one, 3,000, 2,000. So ego depletion, a prolific line of literature. Uh, when I was in my PhD, ego depletion was one of the strongest phenomena, uh, phenomenon in social psychology. Uh, it was the hottest thing in the job market. If you did stuff on ego depletion, you were going to get uh, hired. A very a good group of people uh, from, from uh, various labs, um, you know, coming coming together. Uh, some of who I know personally or collaborated and published with. So I I saw this as, as the most solid phenomenon. Uh, and in 2010, as you can see, came out a meta-analysis. This is what the meta-analysis uh, looked like. Uh, so we've got Martin over here. Um, the, this, this is kind of like the summary of, of the meta-analysis. So according to the strength model, self-control is a finite resource, blah, blah, blah. A meta-analysis of 83 studies tested the effect of ego depletion on task performance. What did they find? Results revealed a significant effect of ego depletion on self-control task performance. So it said, there's no doubt looking at the entire literature. So you have 83 studies over here, you have a K. So it's the number of effects that have been coded. So K is the number of effects. N is the number of participants in all of these studies together. So we're talking about more than 10,000 participants overall in all of the experiments about ego depletion. Over here, you have Cohen's D. Cohen's D is a standardized effect size looking at the experimental versus the control. Um, so in the experimental condition, uh, typically what the, the, the experiment is, is that uh, some people are exposed to an ego depletion task and some uh, people are not. So an ego depletion task is that in one task, you try to really resist uh, your, your urges. There's something that uh, causes you uh, mental fatigue or causes you also to things that need an exertion of willpower to overcome. And then right after that, there's an additional task that requires uh, um, self-control. And then in that task, even though it's unrelated, um, it, it leads to much worse performance because you're not able to exert uh, willpower. So what is the difference between the experimental, the one that, uh, you know, had willpower uh, depleted from them before the second task? So here you see the Cohen's D, the standardized effect size is 0.62. These are the confidence intervals. So lower one, upper one. So these are, this seems uh, very, very solid. Before, you know, I show you later uh, how to look at effect size, I'm just going to summarize this for you. For now, take my word for it. 0 0.62 is considered to be, at the very least, a moderate effect. Some people would have even say this is a strong effect. So if we compare 0 0.62 Cohen's D to the entire literature in social psychology, 0 0.62 is a moderate to strong effect. Now you can see all sorts of things over here. We'll touch this maybe at the end, looking at the variance between the studies. The variance is like 34%. Um, overall, there are some moderators, uh, for example, the kind of tasks. So for each one of these moderators, you can see it's a subset of the studies. So if the K over here is 198, out of the 198, some of them used, you know, controlling emotions, some of them used controlling thoughts. So for each one of those, you can see a mini meta-analysis, so a subset meta-analysis just on these studies. 
And you can see the variation. Sometimes the effect of ego depletion is 0 0.62, sometimes it's 0 0.55, sometimes it's stronger, let's say choice and volition. If you exert, you do a lot of choice tasks, then perhaps the effect of ego depletion is even uh, stronger, so 0 0.82. Some of them had a lot of tasks, so controlling impulses. Uh, let's say, I think a typical one is being in a room filled with an aroma of cookies. There's some cookies on the side, but you can't touch them, you can't eat them. So you're resisting all sorts of impulses to, to eat, eat the cookies. Uh, in the non-ego depletion task, there's some radishes or things that you don't really care much about and you don't need to resist anything. So controlling impulses has the largest uh, number of studies. Uh, and you can see that generally all across these, it doesn't matter what moderator subset you're looking at, what is the K number of studies, how many participants, generally the Cohen's D is very similar across these studies. And all of these are moderate to strong effects, going as high as Cohen's D of 0 0.82. So 2010, I saw this meta-analysis and I thought to myself, wow, so ego depletion really, you know, 83 studies, K of uh, 198, uh, very comprehensive meta-analysis looking at all of these, um, very convincing to me. I had no doubt uh, whatsoever that ego depletion is, is a genuine uh, phenomenon. Issue is uh, that somewhere around the year 2014, some papers starting to come out. And this paper really uh, confused me very much because I did not know exactly what they're trying to say. Um, so let's just look, have a look at this one over here. Uh, publication bias in the limited strength model of self-control has the evidence for ego depletion being overestimated. So this was asking a question. So we did a meta-analysis, we looked at the literature and we found that there is this kind of an effect. Um, what, what, does it, what does it mean? So over here, you can see results from a previous meta-analysis concluded for a depletion of 0 0.62. However, when we applied methods for estimating and correcting a small study effect, such as publication bias, to the data from the previous meta-analysis effort, we found very strong signals of publication bias. Now, if you look at this uh, funnel plot over here, Typically what happens if you have a, a, a funnel plot that represents reality, it seems like if the effect is really different from zero. So if it's, uh, if it's zero, most of these dots that represent singular studies should fall somewhere under this dark triangle. If there is an effect, the triangle shifts to the side towards whatever the effect size is. So if the effect size is somewhere point as, as uh, 0 0.62, then most of these would fall somewhere under, you know, this, this triangle. Now, the issue is, is that uh, if we look at this dark triangle, all the studies that are outside of this triangle are what is significant p-value lower than 0 0.05. If we see a lot of these studies just on the border of the dark triangle, we can see that there's a, a possibility that a lot of these studies just fall short a little bit lower than 0 0.05. And when we look at this, we can estimate what kind of bias there is over here by doing all, all kinds of adjustments. They use something called pet piece. Um, um, so uh, by applying this sort of methods, they came to the conclusion that from a coherence D of 0.62, it became a, a much, much weaker effect. So we're talking about something that falls uh, under the category of a weak effect to no effect, you know, so, somewhere around the zero. So if we estimate, we do all sorts of adjustments to this kind of thing in order to make the studies, we compensate for the fact that many of those are just bordering the p-value of lower than 0 0.05, then we come to the conclusion that is different from that. Now, why do we do this kind of adjustment? Because we assume that if we're not seeing this triangle, if we're not getting what we would uh, you know, expect from reality for the, the general, how, how the distribution of singular studies under this triangle, that there are a lot of studies that are in the file drawer. So perhaps you conducted a hundred studies on something like ego depletion, two of them worked, 
you submit 100 studies to journals and the journals say 98 are not significant. It's not interesting for us. So please don't bother us. Don't waste our time. Reject for 98. We're all only going to publish the two uh, that worked. At some point, you realize the journals are not accepting my manuscripts for p-value lower than 0 0.05. I'm not even going to write those up. I'm just going to put them straight into the file drawer. So the only thing that we see in the literature are those that are p-value lower than 0 0.05. But for every one of those, if we plot these together, so meta-analysis really allows us to see what is missing. And there's a lot that's missing that uh, you know, goes above uh, uh, significance of 0 0.05. Now, this is not the only one that came out. So uh, you can see it's the same author. So Carter keeps going with this. Uh, this is 2015. We find very li little evidence that depletion effect is a real phenomenon, at least when we assess the methods most frequently used uh, in the lab. So once again, the PET, the PEACE, and another one of, of those uh, TES, uh, Test for Excess Significance, that Ionidis and others have developed in order to uh, test whether there's too much significance going on, that they reject everything that's not significant. So um, 2014, 2015, we understand that there is the possibility that a lot of these meta-analyses have a publication bias. Here, um, there's, there's another uh, meta-analysis. This is, uh, came out from 2018, and it was going counter to uh, Carter and his colleagues saying, actually, you used pet piece uh, inappropriately. Uh, perhaps you should do uh, something else. And if you do this something else, perhaps you will see uh, ego depletion. So it's very confusing. So I started like 2010 meta-analysis, solid phenomena. 2014, 2015, wait, maybe it's not solid phenomena. And now you have this thing called uh, uh, publication bias. And now we have all these methods that are coming out to compensate for this. Very confusing stuff. But now they're saying maybe some of them are appropriate, some of them are not appropriate. How do we make sense of this in the literature? In addition, around 2014, uh, more and more uh, methods came out in order to evaluate this thing of excess significance or too many p-values just bordering 0.05. Uh, P-curve is one of those uh, by this team over here. And you can see this uh, interesting uh, plot where they try to say, if there is no effect whatsoever, uh, what you would expect is uh, equal distribution such that um, you know, some will get uh, 0 0.01, some 0 0.02, 0 0.03. We, we're not going to see a big difference between them. However, if there is um, in effect, let's say with a 33% uh, power over here, we're going to see a lot more p-values that are lower uh, than 0 0.01 uh, and less p-values just below 0 0.05. However, uh, it could be that there is, uh, you know, this is the observed p-curve. So looking at the, the distribution, if we have a few just under 0 0.05 that are higher than what we would expect normally, then we uh, come to the conclusion that there is some kind of a bias in this literature. They came up with all these interesting uh, suggestions and this is what it looks like. So if there's no effect 2020, 2020, um, if there is, uh, you know, the stronger the effect, the higher the power, the more likely the distribution is to go uh, towards the lower uh, p-value. So if we see a lot of p-values just below 0 0.05, we understand that we have a problem in this uh, literature. What happens when you apply things like p-curve to the ego depletion li literature? This is what happens. So we would expect, if you have a true effect, we would expect this green one over here. However, what we see in the ego depletion literature is that we have uh, this just below 0 0.05, 0, uh, 0 0.04 is the highest proportions, whereas the 0.01 is uh, you know, lower proportion, lower percent. So we found that effect sizes reported in this literature are possibly influenced by publication or reporting bias, and that even within studies yielding significant results, the evidential value of this research is weak. So 2016. Now, Let's say that you have, so especially with this uh, paper over here, I want to show you a tool that you can use in order to do a P-curve and it will even do a meta-analysis for you. So now we have these shiny apps based on our 
running online that you can use in order to evaluate uh, findings in the literature. And there's this amazing tool called P-Checker, and it does a lot of amazing things for you. So you can um, simply look at the articles and take the effect sizes. So for example, you see a t-test, a t-test equals 2.1, or you have a chi-square, or you have a correlation. The only thing that you do is that you go to the article, you take the statistics and you put it in here. It will automatically convert this to the effect sizes that you need. If you have, you can also add the p-values and then it will check if the p-value that is reported actually matches the results uh, that are expected from running this t-test or from running this z-test or from running this correlation. So it also allows you to check whether the p-values reported in an article are solid or not. Now, I'm going to load one of the few data sets that are in here. They have some uh, demo data. And I'm going to use this uh, exact study, so the glucose and self-control. So this is about the willpower. And if we load this, you can see it's uh, this one over here. So the uh, Vadilo et al. So if we go, it's this Vadilo over here. And what you can see is that somebody took the time to uh, put all the statistics from all the, uh, you know, the studies in this uh, meta-analysis. And if you uh, click on any one of these over here, it will give you the summary of what this ego depletion literature is. First of all, I want to show you uh, uh, what's called StatCheck. So it's a, a method for uh, looking at whether the, the p-values are correct or not, because p-values are not reported over here. It cannot give us that, but it will give us the calculated p-value. So based on these statistics over here, we can calculate the p-value. And just look at these p-values. So p-value 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0 0.03. So you can see not many of them are lower than 0.01. Uh, so now that we have all these p-values, we can look at the distribution of these p-values using something like a p-curve. So the p-curve shows us exactly what it is that we saw over here. And it gives us a conclusion of whether this contains evidential values. So if the p-value test here is lower than 0 0.05, we conclude some evidential value because it's not significant. We cannot conclude this evidential value. If there's evidential value, is it inadequate? So because there's overemphasis on p-values just below 0 0.05, and there seems to be some indication that there's something inadequate going on in this uh, literature. Uh, studies lacking evidential audio were uh, intensely p-hacked. So some, you know, you can, you can also look at this sort of thing. So this already gives you some indication. So if you wanna do a p-curve, you can do that. You can also just press on this and do a meta-analysis. So if you have all of these here on uh, the left, just by you taking this from the literature, you can also see this. And just what I told you, around the zero, this uh, white one, you would expect that we'll have a lot of uh, studies also over here. The fact that these fall exactly on the border of this uh, white space indicates some publication bias. Uh, but it will also give you the meta-analysis, just like you saw in the Shiny apps. So it's remarkable that you can just take the statistics. You don't even have to compute the, the effect sizes. You can just put it in here, push the meta-analysis, and it will give you this funnel plot and the random effects meta-analysis conclusion over here. It will also give you the test of excess uh, significance. It will also do uh, other tests of insufficient variance. So there is definitely insufficient variance in this literature. I hope that's uh, clear enough. You can also do this with other kinds of literature, power posing, elderly priming, a lot of classic effects in social psychology have a very similar problem to ego depletion. Going back to this uh, slide, I'm very confused. So this is around the time when I'm a postdoc. And to me, it's like if ego depletion uh, literature has issues. I really, I don't know what to make of this. Some meta-analysis says this, some meta-analysis does this. Uh, you have all sorts of effects. So what, what to make sense of this? So this is a summary of all the meta-analysis that started from 2010 to 2017. I was looking at this and thinking, oh my God, what am I supposed to do with all of this? So what is the conclusion? 
is there ego, ego depletion or no ego depletion? Question, would you include the P-curve into your meta-analysis paper or is it more usual in a separate paper? Uh, definitely, uh, there, there are some uh, limitations to using a P-curve. Uh, it, you know, it needs a certain kind of, of variance, a low variance in order for you to conduct this. And it also runs not on you know, several aggregated uh, collapse studies, but on singular ones. But if you're able to do a P-curve, Yes, please include this. You can also look at our preprints and we include P-curve in our meta-analysis. I think it's a very important tool, not just a P-curve, P-curve, P-uniform, pet P's, uh, treatment fill, all these publication bias assessments are good to add in there. You can either use this Shiny app or you have our packages and our templates also uh, help you to conduct this uh, very easily. The packages now are very powerful. So you don't, you know, once you've, uh, you have a good data set, it will allow you to run all these publication bias adjustments on this data set. So yes, if you can include this. Now look at this, just imagine you're doing research on ego depletion or you're a practitioner, you want to know ego depletion works or not, or you're a student, you want to know, you know, it's in every book in social psychology, ego depletion works or doesn't work. Look at this, from the beginning, we thought it was 0.62 and now all kinds of adjustments you know, all kinds of prima fill, and it falls down, falls down, fall down, fall down. What, what to make of this uh, literature? So one takeaway, meta-analysis of published literature seems biased. So one of the challenges for you when you're conducting a meta-analysis is to be able to somehow get some of the um, studies that have been conducted but not published. So the file drawer. So you need to reach out. You need to look at preprints. You need to look at theses. And you need to conduct authors to say, are there studies that you may be conducted but you didn't submit? Are there studies that you submitted but were not accepted? Please share those because we want to have an accurate estimate of the literature. Now, we get some indication that there's a publication bias, but it's very difficult because different methods give us different things. So how to solve this problem? One of the ways that we solve this problem, which is why we at University of Hong Kong are doing a mass replication project, is to get a large number of people to run the same study. Again, pre-registered, open data, everything transparent, everybody invited, everybody looking at everything together. And as a team, try to replicate this. Does this replicate or not? So rather just like looking at what the literature is, you can also uh, run, run this again as a mass replication project. Uh, question, would you also include studies published in other languages for meta-analysis? Yes, uh, I know that literature um, language is a problem. However, most of the time, if you're able to contact the authors and, and talk to them directly, they'll be able to explain what goes on. And statistics is a universal, uh, Generally, you would say it's a universal language. So if you're sure, let's say in a correlation table, you see a correlation, it doesn't really matter if it's, I don't know, Hungarian, uh, Hebrew, Chinese, uh, whatever, French, uh, you can go into the correlation table and, and extract that. Uh, just make sure that you contact the authors in order to, um, to verify your understanding of what is the effect that you, that you extracted. So you need to be a little bit careful with this. And you can also use language as a moderator to see, is there a difference between if we use it in this language or we use it in that language? But yes, we aim to include as many uh, studies as possible from the ones that we know that we understand. If we cannot verify uh, what the effect is in a different language, then we, we, don't, we don't include this, uh, but we document. We document everything that we find. And if we exclude something, we need to explain transparently what we excluded. So very good question, thank you for that. Okay, now we come to a, a, a forest plot. Uh, so we ran, we, uh, this team, uh, ran an ego depletion uh, replication register report where many labs from around the world conducted a replication of this one, Sripada et al, which is a, a ego depletion task. The original one found the Cohen's D of uh, 0 0.68 and with this confidence interval. The question is, if we give this to different labs from around the world, what are they going to find? 
So just like I showed you in the mini meta-analysis, here we're looking at different labs conducting the exact same study. And then we try to aggregate these. So zero over here means no effect. As you can see, whenever the confidence intervals do not overlap with the, the null, with the zero, it generally means, uh, with adjustment of the confidence intervals percentage, uh, it means that the p-value is lower than 0 0.05. So because this is not overlapping with zero, we can assume that the original uh, found support for uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. Uh, the question is what happened when we try to uh, replicate this sort of thing? You can see all the distribution of all these labs. I would just wanna say that all these labs are ego depletion experts. Uh, really people that have been conducting ego depletion for a very, very long time. And the question is, what is the aggregated effect size? If you look at the meta-analysis effect, meta-analytic effect for replications only, excluding this original one, you'll see this diamond and this diamond is overlapping with the null. So the uh, left part, which is the lower confidence interval uh, and the higher, so what's between the lower and the higher confidence interval, is, is overlapping with the null. Therefore, uh, generally the effect is 0 0.04. Very disappointing for um, you know, a very classic effect. So looking at this, we're thinking, oh, oh my God. So perhaps you know, this publication bias adjustments for the meta-analysis. So we have a meta-analysis from 2010, but it's, you know, it doesn't take into account that there is publication bias. And if we take experts, in ego depletion, and we try to replicate this as a as, you know, classic effect, and we aggregate all of this in this uh, meta-analysis only of pre-registered open science uh, studies, we come to the conclusion that actually we find no support for, the, for ego depletion. It seems like a very, very small effect overlapping with the null. So you want to look at this forest plot whenever you're looking at a meta-analysis. So now we added this over here. So RRR, 0 0.04, 0 0.04, we came from 0.62 to 0 0.04. This shows you meta-analysis up until we understood all these adjustments are problematic. So one of the things that you can do is take one of these meta-analysis that were conducted before and simply revisit those by first making sure, you know, you know accessing the information and that you can uh, really reproduce everything that this meta-analysis did, perhaps updating this because things have happened since 2010. But more importantly, if there's a meta-analysis in your field and it doesn't do something like a publication bias adjustment, this is a place for you to contribute. You can take what they've done, update this up to this very day and make sure that you include some of these publication bias adjustments and see, does it deviate from the original or not? It could be that in your field, uh, there, there is less of a publication bias. I don't know what field you're from, but we know that in most of the psychology domains, judgment and decision-making, things that we look at, even management, especially management, uh, business, uh, marketing, uh, we have a very biased literature because of this emphasis on p-value uh, lower than 0 0.05. And then, there's room for you to do mass replication efforts, just like uh, uh, Hager uh, did over here. So this is the same Hager. Hager who started in 2010, he did the meta-analysis. He's the, also the one who did the, the mass replication. So Hager went from being an expert on meta-analysis ego depletion, saying ego depletion is there, moderate to uh, strong effect, to saying, you know, 0 0.04, Cohen's D of 0 0.04. What was the response by the ego depletion folks? Uh, so Roy Baumaster and Kathleen Voss over here uh, gave an official commentary in perspective of psychological science saying, this is a misguided effort, elusive implications. You didn't, you didn't do the, the right task. You, you chose this spirada, sripada uh, uh, task. Um, and you, didn't, you didn't ask you know, us to be involved in all this. However, I really like it that they took responsibility and they said, this is 2016, we will organize a pre-registered multi-site replication. So they decided to do their own. They said, okay, perhaps yours was not good enough. We know that ego depletion works. We're gonna show you. So I was very much hoping that uh, some, you know, that we haven't made a big mistake in the literature. These are all people that I know that I care. This, this effect is something that we communicated to all of our students, to practitioners. I wanted to believe that this is true. So I was really hoping that Baumeister and Voss 
are going to uh, fix this for us. Uh, however, uh, this year, just now, a preprint came out with the uh, conclusion. And this is the conclusion. This is by uh, Kathleen Voss, the same Kathleen Voss as over here. And this is what you can see. You can see the forest plot. Now you can read this forest plot so you know what this means. All these are experts, uh, big names in our field. So Willem Hoffman, you know, you can't tell, you can't say that Hoffman is, you know, is not an expert on, on willpower self-control. Definitely not, you know, not even in the, the right direction, going in the opposite opposite direction, some people from the Baumeister lab, you know, all these people are really, Michael Inslet, it's like people who are ego depletion experts really hoping uh, that this would work out. But then when you look at uh, like none of them found uh, support for ego depletion. And if you aggregate all these effect sizes together, what is the difference? 0 0.06, what was this? 0 0.04. This is what, what goes on over here. Now, they added one more thing. They added Bayesian. So now we know how to do a Bayesian meta-analysis. Uh, I, I showed you in Jamovi, there's an option of doing a Bayesian meta-analysis. You can also use JASP. There's some good R packages to look into this. So in Bayesian, rather than saying, uh, you know, uh, does it overlap with the null? Does it overlap with the null and effect size? It tries to uh, say, is there evidence not just against you know, the null hypothesis, but also in favor of the null hypothesis. So Bayesian has uh, additional attributes. It's a very similar distribution, like nothing is uh, very different over here. But what you can see over here is that uh, a base factor of one says, you know, it's, it's not in this direction, not in this direction, but if as we go higher than one, it seems like there's more support for ego depletion or for the effect. If we go lower than one towards the zero, then there's more evidence in support of the null hypothesis. So where do we fall over here? If you look over here at the meta-analytic effect, this is, this is where we are. A moderate support for the null hypothesis against ego depletion. Can you, can you imagine the kind of disappointment that we had in social psychology. So what does this mean? If one of our top phenomenon in social psychology in every book doesn't, uh, we can't uh, find support for this. If you know adjusting, adjusting for publication bias, we can't, we can't see uh, support you know, for evidence uh, supporting uh, ego depletion. If we do this kind of mass replication efforts twice, the second time by the original authors, and then we don't find thousands of citations, 700 papers, uh, you know, when I just stopped uh, publish or perish. What does this mean? This is ego depletion. Can you imagine what, what would happen if we do this on other kinds of, other kinds of domains? So very, very troubling. Uh, I do a whole course on this. Uh, uh, you can go on YouTube and see some of my other lectures of why we need open science and why we need to change the way that we do uh, science. But the most important thing that I want to say is that all of this would not be possible if we didn't do all these meta-analysis, mini meta-analysis, a way to aggregate different labs. The problem is, is that we're focusing on this study, on this study. We're not looking at the entire literature together from above and also looking for indicators of what might go wrong. One thing that might go wrong is publication bias. It could be also that there's a moderator. You know, Sometimes it works in this, it doesn't work in that. But we need something like a meta-analysis in order to organize the literature. And you have the ability to do that using meta-analytic uh, methods. This uh, is a mass replication effort that uh, came afterwards. Uh, and I, I want to bring this uh, here for a couple of reasons. First of all, some of our colleagues are here from University of Hong Kong. Uh, but I also want to say how um, conclusions from meta-analysis can, can be misinterpreted. So for example, over here, they ran, if you look at this, these studies that they ran, so they have a different plot, uh, only one of them found a significant effect, but they said, when you aggregate this together, this diamond just above the null. So 0 0.01 to 0 0.19. So the overall effect is 0 0.10. Uh, what was their conclusion? It revealed a small and significant ego depletion effect. And I saw how people celebrated this paper as, oh, we found ego depletion effect. Ego depletion actually does replicate if you do a mass replication effort. However, you need to be very careful when we, when we look at this kind of thing about drawing strange conclusions. How different 
is this 0 0.10 from 0 0.6, from um, 0 0.06 to 0 0.04? How, how different are these effects? Not, not that different. So even if you found this aggregated effect, just think for a second, what does this mean? So let's say, for example, let's, let's assume that the effect is 0.1. Cohen's D.1, and you want to conduct a study, do you know what is the sample size that you will need in order to conduct this study? Is it feasible to have this kind of effect? Is it something that we want to invest resources in? How do we know? We do a power analysis, and this is where, um, you know, it's something that has been neglected. We need large samples in order to detect an effect. Let's say that we have a Cohen's D of 0.1, and we want to try and detect this effect in another experiment. And we try to um, calculate what is the required sample size in order for us to be able to detect a Cohen's D of 0.1. Now, if you don't know what our effect size is, point, uh, point 0.1, you don't know how to conduct uh, a power analysis. Now we have tutorials that you can watch. So in the last semester, uh, Chinyu uh, did, did a nice tutorial that is shared on YouTube. And also uh, Chinyu uh, and a few uh, others uh, together came in order to write a collaborative effect size and power analysis guide. So if you want to know how to calculate effect sizes, how to conduct a power analysis, just click on this. And you'll see that this is a Google doc. Uh, it's something that you can go, of course you can uh, use this as, as you wish, uh, but you can also contribute to this, um, feel free. It's uh, everything is editable. So how to calculate effect size and confidence interval. So you can go over here and have a look at uh, these, these uh, explanations. One thing that you can see is this very nice table that she knew summarized for us. Um, so what are the benchmarks? So originally Cohen in 1988 said, uh, a small effect is 0 0.2, a medium effect is 0 0.5, a large effect is 0 0.8. So if we go back uh, to uh, this one, what, what is 0 0.1? 0 0.1 is lower than small. Uh, there are all sorts of other papers that came up uh, since then, like this one that was just uh, recently published, uh, updated, uh, this is a preprint, it was just updated uh, to 2021. So a small effect is 0 0.015, a medium effect is this, a large effect is this. So we originally thought it's a large effect, but now we understand that it's weaker than a small effect. If you don't know how to uh, you know, look at correlations, you can also uh, look at this. So originally Cohen said, you know, 0.5 is a large effect, but in social psychology, actually, it's much more feasible for us to uh, think of a large effect as 0.3, looking at the literature. So this is just like, uh, how do we uh, interpret these kinds of effects? You can have a look at the interpretations, how to report these. Um, but the nice thing that the, the Chinyu did over here is that if you want to know how to look at effects, a Cohen's D, Hedges G, um, Glass, uh, it explains everything. What are these different Cohen Ds? And it also explains how to uh, use R in order to calculate these. So very, very simple code. You can copy and you can paste this in your, in your R studio. And very easily you put in the, you know, the sample size, the mean, the standard deviation or standard error. And then uh, you get the, the output. If we want to do a power analysis, we also have a section of sample size planning, how to conduct a power analysis. And over here, you can just take this kind of um, R code and say, if my effect is 0 0.03 and I want to aim for power of 0 0.95, then I would need this uh, number of... So if you want, you can of course uh, go on and have a look at this. Um, and, and, and look at this in that. What is my point? Why am I telling you this whole thing aside from sharing what is an effect size and how to do a power analysis is consider what is the required sample size for 0 0.1. Um, here, I did this for you. So I want to show you what it is. I conducted this either by G power or I ran this in, in R. And this is the required for each group. You need to run 1,200 participants. If you're aiming for a power of 0 
If you're aiming for 95, which we said we should, then you'll need uh, 3,000 participants. I, I think nobody can. Therefore, to conclude that there is support for ego depletion, it's just not feasible because it's not a meaningful effect for us. 0 0.1 Cohen's D is not something that we should invest any resources in. So takeaways, meta-analysis, uh, we emphasize effect size over p-values and p-values, you know, we understand now from publication bias, uh, that is, is a, a problem. Um, you know, we, we need uh, meta-analysis in order to be able to, uh, you know, aggregate effects, look at moderators. It's helpful for us uh, in future power analysis in order to do follow-up research. So sometimes uh, we conclude, you know, the effect is too weak for us to do anything. Even if we look at the most powerful moderator subcategory, there's, there's not much for us uh, to do over there. And uh, even if you don't want to do a meta-analysis of an entire literature, uh, then you can do a mini meta-analysis, uh, you know, aggregating other mass collaboration or your own studies, uh, and then coming to some conclusion from that. Um, like I said, uh, all of these things that I just mentioned, uh, including the effect size and power analysis uh, tutorials, are available on YouTube, so you can go and follow up on that. And also all my teaching uh, materials, everything is shared on YouTube or on the Open Science Framework. So if you want to know more about RRR, um, how to assess a replication, how to do estimates, uh, how to look at a meta-analysis. Um, what is a replication? What is open science? You can, of course, go, go over there. The first lecture, as you can see, doesn't matter what the course is, is about what I call science in crisis, uh, tied to this meta-analysis and mass replication in ego depletion, but not only because, unfortunately, this is one case study. We now have a lot of case studies not just in psychology, but across the fields where we realize that things that we thought are solid, uh, first of all, we understand that there's publication bias. Second of all, we understand um, you know, that we fail to replicate those when we conduct those in an open science pre-registered mass replication effort. Which leads me to this point. Um, we are in grave need of a credibility revolution. Uh, even when we conduct meta-analyses, we need to be very open and make sure that everything that we do is reproducible, especially meta-analysis. You know, let's say that you run a study, uh, RCT. You want to know whether uh, I don't know, a treatment for COVID works or not, whether your um, drug works or not. Um, I, I think, in general, uh, we should share as much as possible. So as a community, we should be able to get to the best treatment as fast as possible collaborating around the world. The, the replicability is not just a problem, um, it's not just a problem in, in psychology, but also in other fields, medicine, chemical research, uh, cancer research, and so forth. We have, we have a, real, a real issue, uh, which, which leads me to the need to um, re self-reflect, to reassess, and to improve our science. And I really like this uh, one, uh, slide that was adjusted, let's say, from climate climate change. So somebody yells after somebody talks about, you know, energy independence and sustainability and green jobs and livable cities. Somebody shouts, what if it's a big hoax and we created a better world for nothing? I see the same thing about open science. So it's like talking about data sharing, about reproducing, uh, uh, you know, things, reducing publication bias, improving our statistics, preventing uh, p-hacking and so forth. So what if this is a big hoax and we created a better science for nothing? It's always good to aim for better science. Therefore, we should really aim for the importance of open and rep reproducible meta-analyses. So I like this slide. So even if you don't agree with me that there's some problem in science, um, assuming, of course, that you know of everything that's happening, then at the very least, uh, it's always good to self-reflect, reassess, and try to improve things. This is where I think we're headed. Um, this is the things that I'm aiming for, generally open science, looking at trustworthiness, reproducibility and replicability, especially this full transparency. The reason why I'm including this uh, slide over here is because I want to say a meta-analysis addresses many of those things that I decided to do in my own research. So it definitely emphasizes effect sizes over significance. It gives you power because you're taking a lot of small studies and putting them, aggregating them together in order to reach 
a, a better conclusion, a more accurate estimate of what the effect size is. It's a phenomenon focused. So you're looking at evidence in order to support your theory. You come up with moderators you know, from theory, but then you test this you know, looking at the real phenomena, looking at the evidence. Whatever you find, findings are findings, including if you find no effects, just like happened with the you know, ego depletion that I showed you, um, it's, it's valuable. And then it's really about collaboration and community because if a meta-analysis is done well, everybody contributes. You contact authors, they give you information, you know, pull, pulling things together. We do everything by open peer review. So if you follow me on Twitter, you know that every preprint, every stage of, uh, of the pre-registration, when we have an initial draft, everything I post on Twitter and ask people, do you want to help us? And everything is open Google Docs that anybody can go in and contribute. Uh, open and reproducible meta-analysis also address the other things. So pre-registration, yes. Full transparency, sharing all materials, yes. So uh, pulling together meta-analysis and open science brings us to the best kind of evidence. If you're doing a meta-analysis correctly, open and reproducible, then you're able to address many of uh, the issues um, that, that our, our literature currently needs in order to improve our trustworthiness, uh, reproducibility, and replicability. All right, so this was a very long talk just to uh, talk about you know, what, what is going on in our field. So what is the meta-analysis? What are the challenges? Uh, how to uh, look at the forest plot? How to interpret uh, uh, things? And why we need open and reproducible meta-analysis? I'm going to show you how to conduct a systematic review plus a meta-analysis. Um, I just want to say that we have a collaborative syllabus in the spirit of open science. If you want to know something about uh, meta-analysis that was not covered here, you want some resource, a uh, bunch of us people who do stuff on uh, meta-analysis decided after SIPS, I think the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science came together and we all contribute to this uh, syllabus. So you can see over here, it's resources for learning, oh, sign in, uh, learning uh, how to conduct meta-analysis. And it uh, includes a lot of uh, things over here you can see on the left uh, regarding uh, many things, many considerations. So even if I didn't cover something and you need additional information, you can simply go uh, to one of these uh, things. There's lots of uh, guides, there's lots of workshops, um, courses even, open courses that you can take in order to conduct a meta-analysis and a lot of the literature. So updated readings on all of the things that have to do with meta-analysis, how to plan a meta-analysis, how to conduct uh, a search, how to code, uh, how to correct uh, effect sizes, how to uh, estimate the meta-analytic uh, models, publication bias detection, how to detect all of these, and even some of the advanced things like how to conduct a multiverse meta-analysis, how to automate your uh, search, how to do SEM, uh, Bayesian, uh, everything is here. So a bunch of us are contributing to this. Uh, there's lots, lots of things in here. And of course, if you want to contribute as well, uh, we'd be happy to have your, uh, your input. What is the process? Uh, I took this from one of the, uh, the slides uh, from somebody else. You have a research question. You develop a, a protocol of how you're going to conduct your meta-analysis. Um, then you do a search. You screen from this uh, search. You extract your data. You make some quality assessment. Then finally, you synthesize. This, what did the process look like? This is from a pub published one. It was just published uh, recently. So when we first conducted the search, uh, we found uh, this number, um, then we removed some duplications. So we went down to 900 and then we screened those. So a lot of things were excluded based on our inclusion exclusion uh, criteria. Um, you know, then we looked at the full text and we wanted to see, uh, do they have everything that we need? Are they really relevant? And then uh, we had some reasons for excluding all sorts of things. And of course we document each and every exclusion, why we did this. And finally, out of this whole like 2000 something, uh, we were able to uh, come down to uh, N of 23. So uh, only 23 articles with 48 
uh, effect sizes that we were able to uh, look at this for, for this kind of uh, literature. Uh, what I want to say just from the abstract, I think this was updated. This was a little bit uh, earlier version. The abstract is the updated one after we conducted another search following peer review. But finally, we share everything on the open science framework. Uh, so it's very important that you share all the data, the material, uh, the code. I want to show you in the folder that you received our meta-analysis examples. Uh, some of our examples are here. Correlational meta-analysis. This was experimental. So we go to the experimental and this is the past behavior and regret. And you can see uh, what it is that we shared. So we shared uh, our coding and analysis. So you can see the R markdown, uh, the PDF. So what does the PDF look like? This is the PDF. So we showed exactly all the analysis that we conducted, all the outputs that came uh, from that, all of our plots, uh, all of the summary. Uh, all this was created from R, from R Markdown. So you should be able to just like look at the actual uh, code, look at how we created this sort of thing. And from this code, we uh, created the uh, PDF, uh, something called knitting. So our markdown is able to combine uh, code and text and finally create a whole document for you. And this is what it looks like. It created the, the forest part, which we later included in the, the meta-analysis. So you can see everything that we, that we did and all of that is shared uh, over here. Um, another thing, of course, the, the figures that are in there, the pre-registration. So this was one of this was the first pre-registration that I did for a meta-analysis. Back then, we had no uh, templates for doing a pre-registration, so I, I just did my best with a master's student. Um, so this is Lucas over here. I want to show you uh, back in the standards of 2017. This is what we came up with. Um, yeah, so you can see uh, it has the background, it had the goals, it had the hypothesis, it had the methods, it had the analysis plan. So it had um, all of the hypothesis laid out clearly with the directionality. Uh, all the moderators were specified in this meta-analysis with a clear hypothesis uh, and the way that it's going to be uh, coded. Um, in addition, exploratory moderators so we didn't have a clear hypothesis for these exploratory moderators so how we coded this and we actually wrote so you know, just the fact that you have exploratory doesn't mean that you can't write down the hypothesis so we actually wrote competing hypothesis maybe it will go this way maybe it will go that way but then just by specifying your hypothesis even for exploratory ones you get to learn uh, quite a lot and uh, in advance you can say what is the criteria for finding support for this hypothesis what is the criteria for finding hypothesis for the other hypothesis so it's very important that even if you do exploratory that you try and specify what is the criteria that you um, that you use in order to establish evidence uh, for something uh, the search strategy what it is that you're going to use uh, we only use google scholar some reviewers uh, emphasize you need to be as comprehensive as possible however we don't always have institutional access to some of these you know the publishers are holding access to web of science and everything else so sometimes you want to use the open ones like google scholar or microsoft academic and i'll show you a little bit what that looks like but all kinds of combinations uh, you can, you know, we specified all the search patterns, uh, eligibility criteria. So what is it that we include? What is it that we exclude based on, based on the DV, on the IV? So even though this was the first pre-registration, we try to be as comprehensive as possible for what this is supposed to look like. Analysis plan, use R, the metaphor package, how are we going to do this? Uh, what are we going to do in, uh, you know, uh, just looking at moderators, the variance, uh, all the others. So what indicators are we looking for? We also were planning and conducted a P-curve and a P-uniform for the one that, that I asked before. Um, and um, sometimes people ask, can you pre-register if you've already collected a few, uh, a few studies to look at the literature? Yes, you can do that as long as you're clear 
about where you are. So we were just, you know, we, we had a, a first look at the literature just to get an idea of what are possible moderators, but we didn't do a systematic review. You just need to be very transparent about this. Uh, yes, it, it is underway. Um, and then we specified exactly where we are in the coding sheet of what it is that we already that we already looked at. So this is just an example of back in 2017, how we did this. Now we're a lot more comprehensive and I'll, I'll show you some, some examples uh, of that. Uh, how to do a search. Now, this is a tricky, tricky business. I would even say that this is so uh, planning for the search and conducting the search is one of the most complicated things about a meta-analysis. Um, and this is where we need to be very, very careful. Now, I talked about the meta-analysis team and I talked about Kevin. Uh, Kevin took the lead on this uh, meta-analysis. And the nice thing is that we did this as a register report. So a register report is you write a pre-registration and before you do anything, before you do search, before you do coding, before you do analysis, before you write the manuscript, before everything, you take the pre-registration and you send this to a journal and you, um, they send this to peer reviewers and the peer reviewers go over your pre-registration plan to give you feedback on how to improve. If they like what you did, you know, there's some negotiation, you should do this, you should do that, we adjust to this, we, do, uh, we had one round of revise and resubmit. Finally, when we both agree that this is the best pre-registration, the best protocol, we get something called an in-principle acceptance. So this one on free will beliefs and outcomes, I think I showed you before free will beliefs and satisfaction. So that's one study. But now we want to look at all the outcomes. We want to look at everything that's maybe pro social or things that adhere to norms or things that are personal like performance, like satisfaction. You can see the study that I mentioned is here. So we want to look at all the literature together and we want to uh, in advance specify all of our search, all of our coding, uh, even the R code is included in this pre-registration. So this was sent to Journal of Research in Personality. I think it was one of the first meta-analysis registered reports. Uh, maybe there was one, but it was more of a pre-registered one. So uh, I think both the editor, the reviewers and us kind of like uh, try to understand how this is gonna work. But finally, it got the in-principle acceptance. So now, it is actually uh, being conducted by Kevin and this, uh, this wonderful uh, team over here. Now, I want to show you how this uh, works. This is really uh, something amazing. Uh, and all of this was pre-registered in advance. So if we go here, uh, where did I put this? Yeah, so free will beliefs and outcomes, this is under correlation or meta examples. You can see that everything that we did, so this is the journal of research and personality, revise and resubmit. This is what we ended up sending. So you can have a look and see what does the pre-registration look like. And actually the pre-registration looks exactly like a manuscript, only it works with uh, either a data analysis plan. So what you're planning to do, or it runs a simulated code. So in your coding sheet, you simulate uh, things as much as possible. You have your our coding sheet over here. If you wanna look at this, you have the email template, how to contact authors. Uh, everything that we did for, for this uh, submission on how to do our register report is here. What does the search and coding look like? I want to show you the uh, instructions that Kevin wrote for the team on how to conduct this search. Yay, so we got the in-principle acceptance. Uh, what's next? Um, this is, you know, so we have a timeline and uh, we did things with uh, Publish or Perish. It's a wonderful software that allows you to do all sorts of things. So this is what it looks like. And um, you can, uh, you know, it's, it's open. So you can go and view this if you want. You can open our Google Docs. Everything is, is transparent and shared. You can have a look at what this uh, looks like. And every step of the way, each one of the team members is responsible for different kinds of search patterns. So for example, this search pattern, free will or free will you know, with, with a, a minus, uh, freedom of will, determinism and outcome. So you punch this kind of keyword uh, uh, in there and then you do the search and then you export this as a CSV 
uh, and you save it in all sorts of ways. And then afterwards we update the code. So very, very detailed about how to uh, do uh, the search. Uh, what does it look like when we open uh, Google Scholar and put this in there? How do we extract the, the PDFs um, and everything else? So very detailed and you can have this plan whenever you're thinking of how you're going to conduct this comprehensive, this comprehensive uh, search. So um, I'm going to, yeah, maybe I can do this. Yeah, okay, so it worked. So I'm, I'm gonna show you, this is, we haven't shared this with you because this is in process. Uh, you, can, you can look at our coding sheet. Um, so if we open this, uh, you, you're also from the PowerPoint, you're able to access this. I'm just gonna double click on this so you can see what this looks like. So this is, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Uh, and it's a remarkable collaboration between so many uh, members because this is a, a large, a large literature. Um, uh, so you can go into this coding sheet, and you can see like we have a timeline, and we have uh, what the coding actually looks like. So it's work in progress. We're still in the search, but what kind of searches do we have? So uh, we identified all the searches that we wanted to do. So this kind of search, and who's responsible for what kind of search? So Diana over here does this. Um, Velvet does this, Kevin does this, and then we see the results of uh, how many returned. Uh, when did you stop and why did you, uh, why did you stop? Because you couldn't find anything else. Well, Google Scholar, what point do you recommend stop screening? So we have, we, we actually, we put this in the pre-registration. Very good question. Thanks for asking that. And we indicate when we don't see a relevant one after, you know, if we come to a page where, uh, you know, we have three pages, with no relevant response, with no relevant results, uh, then that's when we that's when we stop. And it's very important to put these uh, stop uh, signals in your uh, pre-registration. When do you decide to to stop? Uh, so thanks for that. Um, okay, so we saw this. So I just wanted to show you what that looks like. So you can see all this came for uh, from publish and perish, publish or perish. <laughs> This is what it looks like. Um, so let's say, for example, I love this software because it's it's uh, very very useful. You can use this to search on Google Scholar or Microsoft Academic if you want the free ones. But if you have access, institutional access to some of the others, or you can get like a, a temporary one for conducting this search um, for the others as well. So let's say that you are conducting a new search. Let's say on Google Scholar, uh, you want to conduct. Let's say I want all the uh, authors. So I'm just going to do this uh, on me. And it's really nice because it really summarizes everything for you. So as I told you, like the most impactful publication that I have is this meta analysis be between trade and personal knowledge. There's not a lot going on in there, but you can see the year by which uh, things were published. Um, and interestingly, uh, like if, if, for example, I run this, uh, let's say I do a Microsoft academic search. I'm going to search this as well. So what's interesting is that some of them, even everything that I've done on the Open Science Framework, you know, the Microsoft Academic uh, finds stuff. So you you want to use multiple uh, sources, not just uh, the one in uh, Google Scholar, but perhaps also, also the one in Microsoft Academic, because it will have some things about the authors that others will not have. Another interesting thing is that you can actually see, let's say I want to see uh, who cited my meta-analysis, uh, I can do a right click and then I can open citing uh, works in the browser, browser or retrieve citing works in publish or perish. So I can uh, do this. It does uh, the search on Google Scholar. It opens up everything. And then I see everybody who cited our, our work. Um, oh, even some people in Chinese. Okay, interesting. So, um, so then I can like follow up on this. I can of course export all of this uh, if I wanted to, uh, I can export all of this to, I can save this, I can export this to a big file or whatever it is that, that I want to. Uh, and then I can import this to my reference software. Let's say that you have um, uh, Zotero or whatever it is that you use, you can easily export this from that or as a CSV. So this is what the team uh, did. So they each had uh, some kind of pattern and then they just saved all the pattern here. Uh, as round one, um, and then we contacted authors. So we had unpublished data received, 
uh, intermediate uh, papers, so all the PDFs that came from that. And, and finally, like step by step, uh, we, um, we get to the point where we need to arrive at a final set of papers and update everything in our coding sheet. So if you want to see our coding sheet, everything is open uh, because this is a registered report and everything is with open data and open code. Uh, you can look at the manuscript, you can look at the instructions, you can look at the Google sheet and, and learn from that in any way that you would like. So I like this very much because it's a registered report and I love how this team works. And I really like it that we have published or perish to do uh, the search correctly. Uh, just this week, uh, our package that does uh, something, it's called Citation Chaser. Uh, I, uh, Neil um, did this amazing thing. It's a Shiny app. Once again, it runs on R. If you don't know R, you can just use the Shiny app. And it uses something called uh, Lens. So you can get an API, you can put this uh, in there and the Citation uh, Chaser uh, will allow you to chase the citations. You can then export this to RIS or a bib file. Um, yeah, welcome to Citation Chaser. It tells you what you need to do. Um, you need you need your API to open. I don't even rem remember which one this was. Oh yeah, this was a norm theory. So I wanted to see everything that has to do with norm theory. So I just put in my uh, my uh, API uh, file. I did the DOI. So this is the DOI of norm theory. And now I want to look at all the citations of this one. So I can search for all the citing articles in Lens. Uh, so even if you don't have publish or perish or anything like that, you're using the R package. The only thing that you need is this API uh, from Lens. Um, and then it will give you uh, everything from this uh, literature. It might take a while to search, but finally at the end, it's supposed to produce the RIS file of all the citing articles. So these are all the citing articles for non theory. Non theory has like three, about 2,455 citations. Uh, it's ready for download. So if you want to look at everything that's cited, uh, some other thing, there's a few tools for that. I really like it. Uh, I like it that it's reproducible because it's an R package and then it saves everything afterwards. Publish and perish, you need to be very, very careful how you do this. So just like this, uh, you know, the Kevin uh, free will team, you need to be very structured about this. Afterwards, we're going to share everything on the open science framework. But I like it that people are working on our packages in order to do the search in a more structured way. So exciting stuff coming, coming out uh, from that. So once you uh, do the search, once you uh, go through the coding, um, uh, you'll, you'll see that it's, it's quite a process. But after you have all that, actually running the meta-analysis on that is quite straightforward. You can uh, look, where was this? Yeah. You can actually take some of our, our code. So our code is, is shared on the Open Science Framework um, and you're welcome to just like take it, take it and use uh, as is. Uh, and we also have templates, which I'll come back to. So we have, what is it? Like half an hour more. I wanna very briefly discuss some issues with uh, meta-analysis. Um, this paper came out by Ionidis. Uh, just look at this title. Oh goodness. The mass production of redundant, misleading, and conflicted systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Uh, why did he come to this uh, kind of conclusion? There's an explosion, explosion of meta-analysis and systematic reviews in the literature. Sometimes we have literatures that have more meta-analysis than actually uh, studies. So um, he comes to <laughs> the conclusion, 3%, he says 3% are uh, decent and clinically useful. Uh, many are unpublished. Uh, some of them are redundant, unnecessary. I don't know what that means. I don't like this category. I think that everything is, is good. It needs to be shared, but I, I worry about this flawed beyond repair. And I'll tell you what that means. Misleading, abandoned genetics, decent, but not useful. Uh, what are the problems with meta-analysis? Why do we have this, uh, this problem? We have so many meta-analysis, but very few of them are actually uh, useful, um, meta-analysis have to be reproducible. You need to be able to check their quality, to update them on a regular basis, and then reanalyze them. Uh, I don't know if this guy looks familiar, <laughs> but this is Daniel. And Daniel said, I want to examine um, the reproducibility of meta-analysis, how to do this. Let's revisit 
uh, meta analysis in the literature and just try to follow step by step and see and see what happens. So it took Psychological Bulletin. It's one of the top journals in psychology that mainly publishes systematic reviews and meta analysis. And he says we're going to look at exactly the same literature. So we're going to go to exactly the same studies that they did. We're going to code this again with this team, uh, open reproducible, and we want to see if we're going to arrive at the same conclusions. I think this is from SIPS. Sips, one of the conferences in 2017. Uh, and this is this is his slides. This is Daniel's uh, slides and all sorts of, of, uh, of issues. Uh, and the problem is that the underlying meta-analytic data is not uh, always shared. They tried to reproduce 20 meta-analysis from 2013, 2014. They wanted to know how reproducible these are and how they can improve. Now, uh, look, look at this, <laughs> 54 meta-analysis in psychological bulletin, perspectives, psycho uh, psychonomic uh, bulletin and review. Four, so 7% use reporting guidelines like PRISMA. Uh, only uh, you know, 67 listed all the individual effect sizes. I'm not talking about how they computed this. I'm just talking about sharing the effect sizes so that you'll know what it is that they aggregated. Only 67 of them shared. Around 50% of the data is not available. Of the remaining 50%, 50% of the effect sizes seem to be incorrectly calculated. Incorrectly calculated. So they came sometimes to the opposite conclusion from the meta-analysis. So if all data is difficult to retrieve, why not share the data that you got from the, from the authors? You already contacted them, you already did the search, you already coded everything. You want to uh, say something to the literature. How, how could it be that from a meta-analysis we're not sharing, we're not sharing our, our data? Three meta-analysis could not be reproduced at all due to the lack of the table and lack, lack of details. So very, very disappointing. This is not the only project. I'm going to mention one more. How can we fix this? This is from Daniel Lacken's Transparency. Code and share all the meta-analytic data. I really live by this. Definitely share everything. Clearly identify the data and the effect size calculation. What is it based on? So where did you take the effect size? No, don't just send somebody to tell this is the effect size. Say which page, which paragraph. So if you look at the way that we do our coding sheet, not only do we code the effect, but we also code where, how did we come to the conclusion that this is effect? Based on what data, what calculations did we have uh, in order to arrive at that, that conclusion? Um, say everything, you know, we, we include all the code, we share all the R markdown, the way that the data was combined or recalculated, um, share all the data and uh, share all, all the papers uh, that, that, you, that you have. Um, also, uh, if you are sharing the code, please run this on something like R or Jamovi. Don't use these $300 uh, a year subscription, comprehensive meta-analysis software, proprietary, whatever. Just use something that somebody can use in order to reproduce what it is that you've done. So use open source software such as R uh, and, as an exercise, if you are planning to do a thesis or uh, embark on doing uh, an analysis, an experiment, uh, correlational design, whatever, on a literature, and you think that literature is solid because you read a meta-analysis, just go to this meta-analysis. Take 10 studies, 10 studies from the meta-analysis, and try to code this yourself. Then compare this to the meta-analysis. Is this the same? Did they do a good job? Were they transparent? Is it reproducible? If you can't reproduce more than 50%, ignore the meta-analysis. I would say in general, if you can't, if you see some errors in there, then it's really it's time for uh, moving on and not, um, you know, not respecting this meta-analysis because it did not respect science or you. So we really need to be careful about how to do this. Any other evidence aside from Daniel Atkins? Here we go, just from this year, PLOS1. Results showed that almost half of the 224 of all sample primary effect sizes could not be reproduced based on the reported information in the meta-analysis, mostly because of incomplete or missing information on how the effect sizes from primary studies were selected or computed from 33 published meta-analysis. So we don't know what they did over there. We, we just have to trust, uh, trust the uh, scientists. Trust, I'm not, saying trust you know fraud or anything i'm just saying like 
because we don't know what they did and we don't know what was the procedure and we don't know what you know calculations they use i'm saying like we're human we're all making mistakes it's very possible that you'll go into my meta-analysis and you'll find an error i encourage that i will be very happy to issue a correction and adjust whatever it is that i'm that just imagine that there's no way for us to verify we just need to assume that these uh, humans were without errors, that everything that they do, they've done is absolutely perfect. Some journals have limited word counts. Are these details so crucial that they have to be included or will this be linked uh, to your own? So the things that you can include in the actual manuscript, you can uh, put in the supplementary or in the open science framework. Obviously there are some uh, limitations to what it is that we can share. Um, at the very least, all your you know, search coding uh, data uh, and the code to analyze the data uh, should be shared separately on the Open Science Framework. But everything about your decisions, how you decided about inclusion, exclusion, all of that needs to be in the actual manuscript. And most of these, let's say, psychological bulletins, psychological review, most of the places that publish meta-analysis uh, tend to um, um, allow a higher word counts, but whatever it is that you can't include in the actual manuscript, just uh, move to the supplementary and indicate in the main manuscript that they should look for it in the supplementary, which is why in our templates, we have a template for a main manuscript and a template for a supplementary. Um, so you can you can see how we did that over there. Another, another report uh, just came out uh, 2020 about how many meta-analysis in psychology uh, do things like publication bias, about 50% of them, uh, how many report everything that they've done. So you can see the rates are not very encouraging, especially when it comes to uh, sharing everything with others. So we can do a lot better uh, on this. Now we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I wanted to say that Dan Quintana uh, is one of the advocates for uh, open reproducible meta-analysis and he has amazing videos on YouTube where he shows you how to do this on R or Jamovi or JASP uh, and also helps you to understand the implications of why it's important uh, to pre-register, what does it uh, require to do a power analysis of each study in a meta-analysis. So three hours is very brief. Sometimes I spend three weeks going over how to do a meta-analysis, but this will give you a teaser and then you can uh, from here go and uh, learn more about how to do uh, this kind of thing. The question was standardized mean differences requires mean and standard deviation. The stump studies don't provide SD. In this case, can I impute the SD based on? Yes. Okay, good. So if you recall the effect size uh, collaborative guide that we have, we show you different ways of how to compute an effect size when you don't have some information. So sometimes you can just, let's say it's a t-test, you don't have the raw means and the standard deviations, but you have the t-value. There are ways to convert the t-value into a Cohen's uh, D. Uh, if you have uh, you know, an, an f-value, how to convert this to uh, ETA square. So um, in that guide that I showed you before, the effect size, confidence intervals, power and analysis collaborative guide, we give the code and different options for you based on what it is that you have. So sometimes you don't, of course, you don't always have the means, the standard deviations, but sometimes you have other information and you use as much as possible from that in order to compute what the effect size is. Of course, the best would be to contact the, the authors and confirm some of that, but sometimes we have to, we just, we do what we can with the statistics that is provided. So good question. Um, what are the chances of publishing analysis research in high impact uh, journals? Um, good, good question. I, I would first ask what is a high impact journal? If we're talking about uh, impact factor, um, then uh, you know it, it depends. They all have different uh, criteria. Unfortunately, many of them are not very open science uh, supportive, doing things a little bit old school. So Psychological Bulletin has only recently started to uh, implement some open science uh, policies. They still do not accept registered reports. Um, so it's a, a, a slow journey. Let's say 
that you care about impact factors, um, the rejection rate for the top journals that are looking at um, the meta-analysis are typically around 60-70% rejection rate, um, which is lower than the typical 90% uh, for experimental correlational uh, studies. So, um, but they, they're selective. First of all, not a lot of people are doing meta-analysis and submit this to these journals, uh, but generally they're, uh, you know, the rates are, you know, the acceptance rates are higher, reje rejection rates are lower, but it of course assumes that you've done a meta-analysis of the scope that they're looking for. Uh, if you want, we can talk a little bit more about what it means to publish a meta-analysis. Well, the last thing that I'm going to say about publishing a meta-analysis, I would really urge you, encourage you to submit a registered report meta-analysis. Uh, and there are some journals that are doing uh, that. And I'll talk a little bit about that coming right up. Um, one more question. If we recalculate any effect size based on descriptive data, is it meaningful to do a p-curve analysis? Yeah, for sure. You can, you can extract p-values even from, so you conduct, you uh, do the actual test that they've done. You've got the the Cohen's D, you've got the, the T statistic or the whatever statistic you use and you have the p-value, definitely you can do a p-curve. Uh, I think if you remember the app that I showed, I, it, didn't, it didn't put the p-values, it only included the statistics. And from the statistics, we already extracted the p-values. So you can extract p-values even if you don't have the p-value in the manuscript, you can extract the p-value from the statistics. So yes, you can do a p-curve analysis even on that. I want to mention the last uh, section over here because we are about to reach the end. Um, some uh, promising projects about reproducibility. So Nero over here, two PhD students. PhD students, you know, it's up to you. Even if you're a student, you can change the field. So two PhD students that said, we need to do more open and transparent um, you know, reproducible and open systematic reviews. And they have come up with a, a, a form of how to do a pre-registration. They looked at all the PRISMA and all the other protocols for medical sciences and otherwise, and they came up with their own form. It's, um, you know, you can go on the OSF, you can hear them give the talk on the YouTube, or you can look at their website and learn a little bit more uh, about that. Uh, we recently joined up uh, with uh, the Nero team and others who do meta-analysis and, and came up with a pre-registration form for the Open Science Framework. So I really hope that this will be integrated very soon. So you can have a look at the, our preprint. It's, uh, it's, it's up and it uh, allows you to specify everything, it doesn't even matter what uh, discipline you're from. Uh, so this is a very encouraging direction and I really hope that Open Science Framework will give you a pre-registration. The last thing that I want to touch on is a register report. We don't have a lot of time to go into exactly what it is and what it looks like. The only thing that I wanna say is, since you asked about publishing, is that register reports is this new process where, um, sorry, yeah. So it's this new process where you take the pre-registration and instead of just registering this yourself, you take the pre-registration and you submit this to the journal. This is what Kevin did with the free will beliefs and outcomes. And then you get an in-principle acceptance. And only when you get the in-principle acceptance do you start doing the search and the coding. Which journals uh, do this? Uh, more and more do register reports. Uh, you can go on this list over here and have a look. I summarized which psychology journals um, uh, do this. We have two in Journal of Research in Personality. If you're in Judgment Decision Making, you can do JDM. If you're in Management, uh, I think uh, some, someone I, I communicated with uh, recently uh, is targeting and heard from Journal of Business and Psychology. It seem, seems like they're open for it. And there's some uh, like comprehensive results in social psychology only does register reports. So uh, you can submit your meta-analysis register reports over there and keep track of this uh, offered for meta-analysis in this Google Sheet. Okay, so what does it look like in the last, what do we have, like 10 minutes or so? I'm gonna show you our templates. Um, these are templates that we just completed a month or two ago. These are work in progress. So uh, kit, 
in AGN uh, are the ones who, who uh, are doing this. If you want to see what that looks like, you're welcome to go on my webpage and uh, just where, how, what. Okay, so in, on my website, there's this page, meta-analysis register reports. So first of all, you can see everything that we've already, uh, so we have two in principle acceptances. You can see everything that we've done, all the open science framework, all of our coding sheets. You can also see it wasn't a register report, but we, so Adrian um, um, published uh, a pre-registered meta-analysis. So you can see how we did that over there. We also have a, a bunch that are currently under uh, review. You can also look at the old school meta-analysis, but you know this was not open and reproducible, unfortunately. And then you can look at our templates and we have templates for experimental meta-analysis and we have templates for correlational meta-analysis. I'll just show you what this experimental meta-analysis report uh, looks like. I'm just gonna open this. Um, So as you can see, a register report, a pre-registration for a meta-analysis looks exactly like a manuscript. So uh, you can make a duplicate of this and start working on this, just fill in the gaps. It looks like a manuscript. So everything that you're familiar with is already uh, in there. If you want to help us improve this, please, uh, whatever you do, uh, whatever contribution, just add your name, add what it is that you contributed. And when we submit this to a journal, you can be, a collaborator, but generally just use this as you as you wish. Uh, this is a meta-analysis register report. Everything that's in yellow is uh, for you to uh, contribute. What does it look like? So we filled everything for you. If you don't know how to write a meta-analysis, just go through this template. So basically what we've done is we created this template for a meta-analysis where you just need, you know, before, so this is your pre-registration. When you're thinking about your meta-analysis, you're thinking, I need to address this. Everything in yellow needs to be to be uh, addressed. So, you know, when you're doing your introduction, what is the phenomena that you're looking at? Uh, we're telling you discuss the theoretical importance. Uh, you know, why this? Uh, you know, what independent variable, independent variable are you looking at? Um, explain a little bit of, of the background. Well, so it really has uh, everything. You're looking at the main effects. So what are your hypotheses? Uh, you're looking at your moderators. So what are your moderators and what are your specific hypotheses about these moderators? What are your methods? How are you gonna do your literature review? How are you going to do your inclusion and exclusion? You have notes explaining everything each step of the way, how to do your screening. Um, we, we give you some, some uh, recommendations, we give you some, some examples, um, included studies, uh, how do you code them, all the designs, uh, we give you some, some uh, tables. Uh, so really everything that you need is here in order for you to be able to, to execute uh, a meta-analysis registered report pre-registration. Uh, plus, if you uh, If you go back here, you also have a coding sheet. So if you open this coding sheet and the cloud folder, yeah, so this is what a coding sheet looks like. We've done this all for you. So you also have an R markdown that fits with this coding sheet. So if you follow this coding sheet and it's supposed to work for whatever it is that, you, uh, that you're investigating, so uh, you can see what kind of things are on this uh, coding sheet. Um, you know, the country, the code, the general demographics, the sample size, uh, the variables, is it a within or a between, uh, the conditions, uh, explaining the cell one and, and cell two, um, what is the N in each one of those, uh, what is the DV explanation for each one of those, and then, you know, the info coded, uh, how, how did you code this? Where did this come from? What is the page and the table in the article that you took this information from? Um, if you're coding raw data, you can just put the raw data in here. If you're, um, you know, you have some other things. So for example, if you have only the T statistics, so um, put, put in the test over here. And our code knows to uh, look at, 
first, uh, you know, uh, if you have the, the data in the raw data, it will take it from the radar. If you have this from the t-statistic, from the t-statistic. If you actually have the effect size from the article, it will take the effect size from the article. The thing about this coding sheet uh, is that Kit also simulated data. So we encourage you not only to take this coding sheet, but also simulate some data um, so that it will have something. So you can run a code on simulated data when you submit the SPRI registration for, for a journal to know that actually uh, your code works. So take our code, take this template, uh, adjust everything to whatever it is that you need and just plan your meta-analysis. It's very, very comprehensive. So Kit did a wonderful, wonderful job over here based on, on some of the, uh, you know, the other meta-analysis that we've done and some of the other standards in the literature. It's really very, very comprehensive. Uh, some questions? Will the conversion wrap the true effect usually larger or, or smaller? Um, no, you know, when you convert, you convert. It doesn't matter if it's like, uh, of course, the, you assume all kinds of things. Uh, so you need to be sure that you're you're doing the right kind of conversion. You know, is it, uh, uh, you know, how many in each condition, you know, what direction? Uh, um, also, you know, degrees of freedom, are you calculating this correctly or not? It, it's all the same. It's just a different way to represent the same kind of data. T value or Cohen's D essentially uh, bring, bring you the same kind of information. There's not much, um, not much in there. So anyway, what I'm saying is that use our template. It's, it's uh, terrific. If something is not working or you need more help, uh, let us know. Now, where is our code? You have everything shared. Uh, all of that is in here. Uh, you can uh, took, uh, take our coding sheet. And you can also take our R markdown. So R markdown uh, is this RMD code. I'm just going to try and show you what that looks like. <clears throat> so where is the, the templates? Templates are here. So it's also in your cloud folder. So if you want to see our templates uh, so far, this is the experimental one. So what you can see is that if we open this, so basically what you can see is that it includes uh, some text and then it includes some code and somehow it merges these together. So all you need to do really is uh, adjust your uh, coding sheet, uh, enter things like your name and the year. And then finally, our markdown allows you to knit everything. So it brings together your coding sheet with the meta-analysis and brings together by magic, uh, um, execute everything to a document or a PDF. I'll show you what, a PDF looks like, it looks like this. So from this code comes this manuscript and you can see that it includes everything. So this is based on the simulated data that you just saw from the coding sheet. So it gives you an estimate. Uh, it runs all sorts of other things like both multi-level, uh, three-level and the regular ones. It gives you all sorts of plots, gives you APA ready uh, tables that you can just include. It gives you the forest plot. It gives you everything that you need in order to, to run these. So take the, the coding sheet, adjust this to whatever it is that you're studying, take the R markdown, merge this together, and then you should have uh, this, this kind of wonderful output and everything is open and reproducible uh, this way. So in your cloud folder, you have the experimental one, you have the correlational one, uh, and also, if you forgot uh, where this came from, you can just go to my website. Everything is open and shared. Everything is accessible to all of you. If you want to work with us on this, if there have something that's missing for you, and you want to contribute to this, um, we're, we're very happy to, to have you over. Just tell us what it is that you need. Tell us what it is that you contributed. Add your name as a co-author. And then as a community, we can, we can do better. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're pre-testing this right now. So Kit is running uh, another uh, meta-analysis on the action effect. And we're also using this for others. Uh, Adrian is, is, is using this for his correlational uh, meta-analysis. So we're, we're going to be pre-testing this for a few months. At the end, we'll submit this as a, a template uh, for somewhere uh, later. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, here is uh, Adrian talking about what it means to uh, do, uh, first of all, the pre-registered meta-analysis with me. So let's say that you're an early career researcher. When he did his first meta-analysis, he was a master's student. He's now a first year PhD student. He's the one who did the template for the correlational meta-analysis. And he talks about what it means to run a meta-analysis. 
you don't need to believe me or hear from me. Just, you know, listen to these two where he's talking about how we started working together, what it means, what it meant for him to uh, work on a meta-analysis, what it means for him to work on this uh, template uh, right now. So you can just listen to him. You can also listen to Kevin and Velvet. So Kevin is the one leading the free will beliefs and outcomes register report. So he talks about what it means to do open science and what it means to do register report. Velvet is the one doing uh, the dark triad and personal values, which is the second one that got in principle acceptance. And she's in a very, very advanced stage. So with Kevin, we have an entire team. Uh, with Velvet, it's just me and her, and she does uh, uh, most of the work. I, I go and verify, uh, and this is in, in a more advanced stage. So this is also shared with you here in the meta-analysis examples under uh, correlation on you know, the values and dark triads. So you can learn from Velvet as well, and you can hear from her. This is on YouTube where she shares her own journey on how she did. Also, first year PhD student, amazing. A uh, very high quality open science one. This is uh, from Krishna. Krishna is, uh, so Kevin is, has been working with Krishna from his lab. Um, this is as, you know, an associate professor, what it meant for him to do a register report. So submitting a, a pre-registration to the journal and going through that. I'm not gonna go through this whole thing. I'm just gonna summarize what it is that he said, that it was a very rewarding research experience, was by far the most rewarding research experience for him. So it's it's unbelievable that, you know, he's an, he's an associate um, editor in JPSB, and he says that this, is, uh, this was the most rewarding research experience. So really submit register reports. This is the way to go. This is real science. You get real, real feedback, takes away all the uh, uncertainty about what the outcomes are going to be, um, so forth. Let me see. Yeah, so we are about at the end. There's still a lot more slides, but we're not going to go over this. But I did want to give you these slides about Danny Lackens talking about how to do a bias, uh, you know, bias assessment and Joel Hilgard talking this amazing, amazing shiny app about, you know, you got pet piece, you got uh, trim and fill, you've got P curve, you've got P uniform, you've got all of this. Which ones to use? Joel Hilgard has the solutions for you. So go ahead, use his shiny app, look at his preprint, uh, correcting for bias in psychology, which method to use, which one performs uh, the best. So uh, Carter over here together with Joe, uh, Will and Felix. Felix really is, also took some of his slides. All the shiny apps that you saw before, um, uh, really he, he did the, those. So amazing stuff. Uh, please, please have a look at those. What else did I have for you over here? Some other cool tools, some R packages. Visit the syllabus and, and see everything, uh, everything in there. So um, this is where we're going to uh, stop. I'm going to stay here for those of you who uh, want to talk to me uh, more. I'm going to stay here for about half an hour until you know whoever wants to leave. But I'm going to conclude this uh, now. And I want to conclude this uh, by saying that there are uh, reasons for us you know, to uh, self-reflect and reassess and revisit everything that we do in science and especially meta-analysis. I think the case study that we, um, that we reviewed shows that. However, I'm optimistic for the future because now we work together as a community collaboratively to provide solutions, real solutions to the templates. And a lot of this change comes from you, from early career researchers, you know, MPhil, PhD, postdocs. It's unbelievable the kind of change that is happening because of early career researchers. So you have the power, you have the means, you have the skills to come in and really contribute to help our science become better, uh, more reliable, more trustworthy. So that hopefully in a decade, our science will do better. We won't have all these systematic uh, problems. We'll have some uh, tools. We'll, we'll know better what works and what doesn't work. So I encourage you, uh, come and join us. Uh, work together with us. If you want to work with me, if you want to work with some others in the team, please reach out. I'm uh, very, I try to be very responsive. I'm very active on Twitter. You've got my website. So everything that we do, everything that we've discussed is, is on this website. Feel free to uh, email me uh, directly and tell me how you're doing. If you need help with a meta-analysis, 
I can either try and help you myself or team you with uh, another person that is doing something. It's very important for me to help you do well in your career, to promote and, and uh, assist everybody who tries to do things better, to try and improve science. So thank you so much for bearing with me for three hours. I know that was exhausting. Thank you so much. And on Lunar New Year, uh, different time zones, uh, remarkable. Everything that we do is going to be shared on YouTube. Thanks again for taking the time. I'm going to stay here for half an hour. Uh, this is it for now. I'll see you in the next workshop. Thank you so much.